Okay. Um, as uh, you've just heard, our recording is in progress, and I think we've just been joined by our keynote speaker as well, yeah. Shirley Rodriguez. So welcome to Shirley. Thank you for all of you uh, for coming along today. Uh, we should have uh, an increase in the number of attendees as uh, the evening uh, goes on. We are scheduled from 5 to 7.45. Uh, not to worry, Felix, you are very well represented by Dave Fuller um, uh, from your Repowering London and Sheffield. Hi, Shirley, very good to see you. Uh, thank you very much for uh, coming along today. Uh, thank you all. We've got a really good representation of groups this evening. And Shirley, I was just saying, we just had a very successful AGM as well, uh, which uh, it's always good to know we were either Cora or Cora in one of the two, and we were more than that. And actually, we had a, a good level of voting by members, which is really excellent to see that the kind of so many groups are thriving in the capital at the moment. Um, we've got a very packed agenda. Uh, I always do this. I make a rod for my own back by creating a conference with a vast amount of speakers. But we're really trying to address today the issue of not only uh, is uh, London doing very well in terms of progressing on community energy, but we've got uh, an awful lot more that we can do uh, to deliver. But there are the three things I'd like people to think of in this conference as we go through is one, uh, we can deliver more projects. Uh, but we need to work with local authorities and government uh, and uh, London government uh, more closely and importantly we need to get more Londoners and a diverse set of Londoners involved in delivering projects across the capital so that's a strong central thread that I'd like to can I inject a thread I'll inject a thread throughout today's uh, discussions and proceedings and that's very much uh, something that we'd like to take forward in the coming years work on Community Energy London. I should say this event is part of London Climate Action Week. If you're not aware of that, uh, LCOR, London Climate Action Week, has been going on uh, for this week with something like 170 events. Um, and uh, it's been very interesting uh, to see what kind of issues have been discussed. We're very pleased that we've got a very strong London contingent here of issues core to the capital um, as part of our event for LCOR. Uh, and you know reflecting the work that uh, all of you do. Um, Catherine do you want to bring up the first slide um, and then uh, that will help me in terms of guiding us through uh, today's proceedings. So um, next slide please. Uh, hopefully we've got all our speakers who have given a, who are presenting slides have sent them to Catherine. I know there's one person who has it, who's me, uh, but we'll be doing that short, I'll be doing that shortly. Uh, just to say, uh, we will be recording this event. And so uh, if you uh, do not wish to have your presence reflected anyway, either turn off your camera, change your name, uh, and uh, you know the, the routine, uh, please keep yourself on mute unless you're asked to speak. And I should say, as it says there, after each presentation section in the main part of the of the conference, we'll be having a Q&A session uh, to really kind of, uh, uh, you know, help our, our discussions. I, I should say as well, we will be uh, putting, we will be preparing a note of some of the findings from today's uh, conference, and we will be distributing that across London uh, decision makers, MPs and councillors post event. Um, so if you wish some of those issues reflected in our note, please make yourself heard either by asking a question or leaving a thought in the chat column. Uh, will the slides be available after the event? Yes, they will be on our website, communityenergy.london. And if you're in uh, the mood for using Twitter and any other bit of social media, uh, hashtag power of community energy uh, is our hashtag. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, this is our agenda for this evening. Uh, we're delighted to have Shirley Rodriguez, the Deputy Mayor for Energy and Environment uh, and or from the GLA, who have been really core uh, to uh, the success for the community energy sector in London over the past uh, four years, uh, with a strong support uh, from the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan. And Shirley will be giving uh, her thoughts on uh, where we are with Community Energy London and hopefully uh, reflecting uh, thoughts on things going ahead in the future. Then we've divided the event up into three sections. Um, 
the, the, the potential for community energy, both in terms of the number of projects and the scale and diversity of projects. That will be in our first section, the power of community energy. Uh, then uh, how groups are working in their local community to really galvanize uh, community input into projects. That's community energy in the community, uh, where we'll have uh, Toby Costin, hopefully Neil Scott Grant. Neil, if you're here, forgive me, I really wanted to speak to you in advance of the conference and I just haven't managed to, and hopefully there'll be a presentation from me as well. And our third uh, section is uh, new directions for community energy that's kind of highlighting innovation in not only the technologies but the types of projects that community energy groups are doing and we're delighted to have Dr Giovanni Speciale from Celsi, Felix White from Repowering London and Dave Powis from Home Energy Action Lab and just want, uh, again after each um, roughly uh, presenters will be having 10 minutes each then a, a 15 minute Q&A we're bound to go over time one way or the other but I'll try and keep us to time such that we finish exactly on 7.45, if not earlier, if the Q&A sessions are shorter. I hope that's okay. I'll be monitoring the chat. Catherine Lindsley, uh, our coordinator, uh, she's operating the mouse and driving the slides. Uh, without further ado, um, unless I've forgotten anything, which I'm sure somebody will point things out to me, I'd like to uh, welcome, delighted to welcome, that's one that after Shirley, if that's okay, uh, I'd like to welcome, if you take the slides down actually, uh, Catherine, uh, our keynote speaker, Shirley Rodriguez, Deputy Mayor for Energy and Environment. Shirley, over to you. Thanks, Syed, um, and hello everybody, and thanks for inviting me to speak at uh, Community Energy's London Annual Conference. Um, and thanks to all the community groups on the, uh, on, uh, the, the Zoom meeting today who are really helping to make London a net zero city by 2030. Um, as Syed mentioned, this week is London Climate Action Week, and it's one that was devised. Yeah, ago. it's Climate Action Week. It is, <laughs> which focuses attention on the work which is being done on addressing the climate emergency here in London. And I think one of the things we wanted to do in supporting London Climate Action Week is, is to really highlight that there are so many stakeholders in London working on this agenda from businesses, community groups like you, uh, local, regional, national, um, even international government, media, academia, individuals. Um, and, and I think people don't recognise the wealth of people, the extent of, of people working in, in, in London on this issue. It's, it's, you know, when you talk about clean tech hubs or, um, you know, um, you know, various sort of industrial sectors or, or whatever, people forget that actually there's a, there's a lot of people working in this, uh, in this area. Um, and of course, the London Climate Action Week is also uh, another opportunity to sort of cut through the jargon, really um, celebrate um, the action that people are taking on the ground or on the roofs uh, to address the climate emergency. Because I think that's what makes um, climate action real. You know, um, Sadiq talks an awful lot about air pollution because it's a way of making it relevant to people's lives. You know, emissions, you know, uh, solar v PV, you know, watts per hour or whatever, you know, just doesn't cut it, I think, for people. So we've got to try and make it more real. Um, climate action is now its fourth year. Um, and of course, we don't have that long till 2030. So we have a huge... Um, um, activity a lot of us have got to work together to really get uh, get moving so that we can meet that net zero deadline and we need you at working at the community level uh, who are where the day-to-day -day, uh, decisions are made about where we live and you know how we uh, power our communities and our workplaces you know affects you so we need your voices in this conversation um, and for that transition to be net zero and for one that is a just transition we need to also make sure that you know this action that we're all trying to take um, benefits all Londoners, and so we need bottom-up grassroots action. So that's why I'm really delighted to be speaking here today. And and you know all of this. You know it's the biggest global th threat we face. As Sadiq talks about it as an ex existential threat. Uh, it's one that you know we can't tackle alone as individuals, as communities, as a country. We need international, national, global cooperation. Um, and whilst there has been some movement in certain sectors, it's, you know, so far really been sorely lacking in, in the sort of um, impetus and um, effort that's needed. Um, and of course, you know, what's happening in Ukraine, um, rising global temperature rises, you know, the, the energy price uh, rises, the cost of living crisis. 
um, you know, are all militating, you know, are, are, are trying to give a pass to, you know, to not taking action to revert to fossil fuels. Um, and it's now all the more important to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels and move more quickly to net zero. You know, working on community energy projects, wind, solar, is absolutely the way to reduce um, our energy dependence on those uh, countries that produce those fossil fuels, um, but also preserve our energy security, but also, as we know, uh, help with cost of living by cutting bills, make our homes more uh, warm and comfortable um, as well, so better for our health too. Um, and Sadiq um, therefore said, we've got, to, we've got to push harder. We've got to achieve net zero by 2030, which is why he brought forward his target. And at the beginning of the year, he published his um, uh, accelerated green pathway, which is basically an approach to set out what we need to do, you know, what the challenges in scaling up action um, and radically um, reducing carbon emissions. And we can do it with the right ambition, the leadership, powers and funding. You know, many of the solutions um, that we need are there already. It's about scaling up. And as I said, we need to do it together. And if we can manage that, you know, by bringing forward that target, we're going to save an additional 151 million uh, tons of carbon by uh, compared with the previous target um, and reduce our energy bills. You know, when we when we um, looked at the cost of um, uh, the energy that we use to power our homes and uh, for our transport and, and so on and heating our homes, um, the cost roughly is about 11 billion pounds a year. If we meet that 2030 target with the, the things that we're talking about, like retrofitting and reducing vehicle kilometers and so on, we can halve that. And this was even before the, the massive uh, skyrocketing energy prices that we have at the moment. So very significant savings that are to be had out there. Um, and action, of course, on renewable energy, on community energy is absolutely critical to that, that agenda. But of course, community energy isn't just about reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the projects that, that you've been uh, implementing, supported through the Mayor's London Community Energy Fund, have really helped to build resilience in our communities. And this is a you know one of the things that was highlighted during the pandemic. And I think you know working on community energy is, is another example of how you know we can bring Londoners together, working collectively towards a, you know a goal, and, and in this case, tackling the climate crisis. But you know, whether it's training volunteers or inspiring fellow Londoners to become part of the solution, it gives opportunities for all Londoners from all backgrounds to learn new skills and then go on and play a part in, in what we want London to be, you know, a green economy. Um, and I know that your support that you provide, you know, the face-to-face -face support, the really um, critical support you provide to low-income and fuel poor households played you know, such a huge part during the pandemic, but you know, it's, it's playing an important role in supporting Londoners through the cost of living crisis. So, so thank you for that. Um, and just a little reminder about the Energy Fund, you know, we, we launched this, the Mayor launched this in 2017, and that was in recognition of the support that you needed and wanted to develop new energy projects because um, the government had withdrawn its Urban Community Energy Fund. And so having done the consultation with you and with SAIL and Syed and others, um, you know, that was where people would say, this is where we need help. Um, and that very first round, very small, we supported 10 projects. And ever since then, you know, because of you and your successes, the scheme has grown and matured and it's now in its fifth round. Um, and we've offered uh, grants to 125 projects across 25 boroughs, 55 different organizations. And in total, that's um, a contribution of about one and a half million uh, pounds of funding for the development of community energy projects. But I know that you've managed to lever in much more money um, alongside of that. Um, and that's enabled community energy projects to install one and a half megawatts of solar PV across the capital and projects on heat pumps and battery storage and LED lighting, lots of other energy saving technologies to show that, you know, what we talk about is possible, is doable, is there on your doorstep, is there on your roof and people can see it making a difference to people's lives. And it's in those buildings that we, you know, that everybody uses, you know, the cross section of Londoners, whether it's our schools or places of worship, community centres, libraries, theatres, even a cinema and GP surgeries and so on. That really raises awareness of energy issues and how we can tackle climate change by being so visible in, in our community buildings. Um, and, you know, it, it's a tribute to you that you've done this, despite all the challenges we've had, you know, whether it's the removal of the feed-in tariff and the community, you know, the community energy fund or the COVID pandemic and the supply chain constraints that we're having um, at the moment. And now, of course, the cost of living crisis as well. But you've been absolutely brilliant in, in you know, adapting to, to this. 
um, and um, really focusing on the big issues like, like as I said, the cost of living crisis. So um, in terms of, um, you know, the, the, the future role of, of community energy, you know, we're very keen to support that. So I've asked the energy team here um, to survey and speak with you to understand, you know, what is the support that you need? Is it still, um, you know, development funding uh, in terms of business case support, or is it something different? Things are changing. Um, so what, what can that be? Um, so if you haven't already responded to our recent survey, then please do. Um, um, and Saeed will make sure that, that you've got the links that, that maybe you can, you know, you can forward it around to, to attendees um, and to your membership. Um, because we really want to bring community energy to all the communities in London. So we need your feedback too, because you're the people closest to it. You're the ones that are doing the projects. So we need to understand what is it that you need us to help you with. Um, and um, as Saeed mentioned at the beginning, you know, we want more and more uh, projects. We want diverse projects in, in the sort of projects that you're doing, but absolutely we want them to be more inclusive, you know, serving all of the communities, um, the ones that are most, you know, sort of uh, are underrepresented, um, you know, who are, you know, probably more likely to be in fuel poverty or live in areas of poor air quality or access to green spaces. So, you know, we need your help. To, to, to make sure that we're reaching those, those um, uh, underrepresented communities. So looking forward to your comments and wishing you every success as you're um, you know, developing more and more projects um, and good luck with that. And as I said, thank you for everything that you do. And of course, thank you to Syed and Sal as well for your brilliant leadership in this agenda. Um, so I'm gonna end it there, but thank you very much. That's very kind of you, Shirley. Thank you very much for that. That was, you know, you've uh, captured a whole uh, series of issues there, which are quite uh, important uh, to the sector. Uh, I think Nadia, who's uh, posted a comment in the chat, kind of really sums up an awful lot of what we feel, which is LCEP has been a lifeline for community energy, especially considering both the urban, and I'll touch upon this shortly, the rural community energy fund have both been scrapped by government. Uh, Nadia also represented Cell and her own organisation, CELSI, early this week at the London Env Assembly Environment Committee. And uh, she made a very strong point of this to Assembly members about the core role that GLA has been providing in supporting the growth of community energy across the capital. And I'll, I'll just be reflecting upon that difference between London and outside mm -hmm. of London very shortly in a slide. So yeah, I think in total, those, those numbers you've been given on LCEF have been absolutely critical to not only helping uh, projects grow in London, but also for the groups to grow and evolve as organisations and then liaise with their local authorities to galvanise their local authorities to also help community energy groups as well. So, uh, you know, that's been a really interesting journey as well. And I know that we couldn't uh, have him today, but Mayor Philip Glanville of Hackney was hoping to join us, but I think he's on a train from Harrogate somewhere and we're going to catch him at an another event soon to talk about their latest community energy fund. But Shirley, thank you for your time. Uh, that's been really, really helpful. And we're really hoping that you'll be continuing to support uh, community energy through LCEF for future rounds. And <clears throat> excuse me, also uh, when you get a chance, uh, voice um, uh, how well the community energy sector is doing with support to ministers when you get a chance for face-to-face -face meetings. And maybe also to get Sadiq to kind of visit a few more of our projects in the near future, if that's okay. Yeah, I think we definitely need to do that. And and Greg, who's uh, um, the officer leading the surveys, just posted, I think, in the chat, the Quite right. link to that. So thanks to Greg as well. Cheers. Yes, uh, that's a really good point. Thank you. I'd forgotten about that. The, the, the survey, uh, which will hopefully uh, provide input into the GLA to shape the next round of the LCEF. Uh, if groups want LCEF to continue, please make sure that you input your thoughts against that survey because that's been really helpful in the past to shape the way in which we move from a pure feasibility scheme to also a scheme that's providing capital to projects as well. So, uh, you know, make sure your voice is heard by responding to that survey. Shirley, thank you again. You're welcome to stay. I'm going to, uh, or uh, I know you're uh, busy with other LCOR events at the moment as well, uh, yeah. but we're going to continue with the rest of the uh, conference and look forward to catching up with you soon. All right. Thanks all. Yeah. Bye bye. Who's there? Uh, uh, I was going to say Sydney because I can see Sydney, but I meant Catherine. Uh, Catherine, would you move to the next slide before? But um, very quickly, uh, just uh, uh, I wanted to just highlight a few thoughts of how the sector is doing in London 
uh, compared to elsewhere outside. So uh, just one slide for me, you'd be uh, pleased to know, but uh, community energy in and out of the capital. And thank you for Duncan McLaren. Uh, just early this afternoon, Duncan and I, uh, the interim co-chief executive of Community Energy England, we had a, a conversation about some of the things that are going on at the moment at the national level. <clears throat> so uh, one thing is uh, Community Energy Fortnight took place early this month and Community Energy England published their state of the sector report. And whilst good work has been going on across uh, the country, uh, their report rep uh, states that in 2021, Community Energy faced its most challenging year ever as government ignored calls uh, for the set from the sector. And also they highlighted, despite COP26 and increasing public support for renewable energy, government support mechanisms uh, for community energy have been uh, removed. And uh, my words, not Duncan's, but uh, to add insult to in injury during community energy fortnight, we found that RCEF, the Rural Community Energy Fund, uh, was not to be continued and the, the sectors ask for a national community energy fund uh, was not going to progress with ministers. So if you go to uh, Community Energy England's website, you can see that state of the sector report and also that news release. I should say uh, the closure of RCEF, the Rural Community Energy Fund that followed on from the premature closure of the Urban Community Energy Fund back in 2015, and the closure of USEF actually stimulated the creation of Community Energy London and our work with GLA to eventually bring forward the London Community Energy Fund. Just to say one of the other interesting things, uh, and perhaps uh, Catherine, if you could pop uh, the link into the chat when you get a chance, is that the Secretary of State uh, was giving evidence to the Energy Industry Select Committee early this week on Tuesday. And when he was asked about community energy, he got it confused with what um, uh, energy initiatives are being undertaken by local authorities, initially citing Robin Hood Energy, which was the Nottingham um, uh, uh, supply company. So clearly we need to help the Secretary of State understand what we do as a sector uh, a bit better. Uh, as you know, uh, there's a recognition that net zero targets cannot be achieved without greater public participation and yet we're seeing these uh, this removal of support mechanisms for community energy. Um, the government did uh, commit to creating a new community energy contact group uh, which actually was something that was in operation from around about 2012 to 2015 but then was disbanded. Uh, we had our first meetings of community energy contact group around about three weeks ago uh, with Bayes officials and um, there were kind of mixed views on how well it was uh, underwent but it was the first meeting and London is well represented on that group uh, so we'll be making sure that we highlight issues core to the capital in supporting community energy and, and just to say in addition to the great work that we've had uh, from the GLA and uh, I'm really pleased that we've got GLA's uh, main community energy officer, Greg Shreve, here today as well, uh, who Shirley mentioned. We've also seen in the last two months alone, two capital funds pop up to support community and energy in their borough, a £300,000 Hackney Community Energy Fund. And as I said, we'll hopefully have uh, Mayor Phil Glanville from Hackney talk about that at a future cell event. And also in uh, late May, we saw Hounslow, uh, start their community energy fund and we'll, uh, Catherine, if you don't mind dropping those links in the chat column as well later on. But, uh, oh, thank you. Greg has mentioned that Emma Gray is also here on the GLA as well. Hi, Emma. Uh, but all of this, it comes down to the main point of, uh, of why we've called this conference together here today is that working successfully with the GLA, we've seen what the community energy sector can do now uh, we really want to build on work that we did in 2021 to bring on more councils as we've shown with Hackney and Hounslow but importantly we really need to make sure more Londoners understand what community energy is get involved in projects in their local area um, and that could be from direct volunteering to investing to shouting out about it 
We've had the local elections in London only in May, and we're trying our best to kind of liaise with councillors to highlight what community energy can do. And I'll talk about that a little bit later on with some of the work that we're doing with Cells Map. Um, but we've come, I think, uh, to the time that we're going to move to our first session. So I will shut up, you'll be pleased to hear, and we'll move to uh, the first session, which is talking about uh, the scale, the number and the diversity of projects that we hope to see. Uh, as I mentioned, we've got around about 10 minutes per speaker uh, with a 10 to 15 minute Q&A. So if you've got questions, drop them in the chat and I will be chairing that Q&A after our three speakers have spoken. So grateful of people, uh, don't interrupt them. If you can mute yourself during the speaker sessions and you'll have your opportunity to raise your issues uh, during the Q&A. Our first speaker I'm delighted to invite is Mike Smythe from Schools Energy Co-op. Mike, over to you. Hello, everyone. Uh, Catherine, can you put up, actually, I'm going to do them in a slightly different order. Can you put up the second slide first, please? And then I'll go back to the first slide. Thank you. Uh, right, hello, everybody. And, uh, good, good to see you again. I've been asked by side let's say to focus on the power of community energy and particularly the potential for a high number of community energy projects in London because we have done not a high number but at least a, a reasonable number so we are at 30 solar roofs in London although that's cheating slightly because we're counting one um, as one, one school with two systems on it we extended it um, and of these, there's 16 of them in Ealing, seven in Harrow, two in Camden, which we have recently actually transferred back to Camden Council, uh, two now with the Southwark Diocese and a fair number of other schools in South London underway with them, um, and one private school, the American School in London. So London is about a third of the activity of Schools Energy Co-op, uh, 95 sites, completed so far will be up to 100 by the end of the summer holidays if not more with as I mentioned on the slide about three and a half megawatts installed so far um, and the 780 members all the schools become members so the members of the public are we try to get in the areas of the schools there's about six well about 680 of them we distribute our surplus to schools. It's a, it's a slightly different model from community benefit societies. We are a schools cooperative to help schools tackle climate change by having solar panels. So that, that's the background to where we are and the various dots on the map, uh, a bit random, um, sort of indicate where we are working, which is broadly where we get contacts from. So there's a lot in London, there's a batch in East Anglia, a batch in the West Midlands, and a batch in the Greater Bournemouth area. It's, it's where most of our work is. So if we can go back to the first slide, Catherine. And you know, just sort of talking as to how we get there, I think the, the first point we make is community energy groups are, they're all independent and they're all very different. Uh, and our We've, we're focused on delivering solar panels on schools, but the simple message of cut carbon, save money, free solar panels. So it's not a different approach from any of the other groups doing solar on schools, except possibly to the extent that um, we also say we, we rebate any surplus we make back to the schools so that nobody is making any, any money out of the schools. And the the advantage is what well, we chose schools uh, partly because there's lots of them um partly because their their title is straightforward you're not dealing with structures of commercial landlords and borrowing um partly because they're hard and, and therefore and not that big so you don't get the commercial sector participating on the whole and partly as a campaign i mean our idea is that every person who Every, every school child can be aware that their school has solar panels and it just becomes a normal part of their life. Nothing special about it at all. And then as community energy, we're a natural fit with the, with the public sector. And although individual schools are jolly hard to deal with, at least the local authorities and many um, academy trusts have multiple sites. So once you 
start working well and get trusted, uh, you can usually then move on to other sites. We're a small group. Um, and I say our, our focus is very much on getting more solar on schools. We really don't try to do other things like education or um, obviously or fuel poverty or, or things like that. That's, we just stick to what we can do. And with that, we work through partners. Uh, I'll describe them later on, of which Energy for All is probably the crucial one by providing our back office. And we just hope also that what we do can demonstrate what community energy can do. And there's plenty of examples out there now, loads of schools and our flagship, which is actually not a school at all, but is the solar panels we've got on Salisbury Cathedral. So what I would say is you know, if the target is doing megawatts, then spending hours and hours on this is not the best way to do it. But this is a, our target is to green a city and to enable everyone who goes to school to become aware of what can be done. So if I just move on now to slide three, Catherine, just to say a little bit about Energy for All. I mean, Energy for All is a cooperative of community energy organisations and it provides, um, well, there's 32 current um, members who share resources, who share the back office and also make a contribution towards development of new community energy uh, projects through, through that relationship. So Energy for All has a back office. It also has a project development team of which I'm part. And I think Zach is on the call as well, who is a, a full-time project manager for Energy for All. So the, the, the Energy for All members have this mix of volunteers such as me and professional staff such as those in the accounts team and, and project managers such as Zach. And we've been supported by, uh, uh, by, by Energy for All by having a disproportionate amount of project management support to carry on doing more and more schools, which, is, which has been very valuable. Going on to the next slide. You know, we're a small group, there's five or six volunteers uh, actually at Schools Energy Co-op who are doing this, plus Energy for All. But we then try to work with local partners. So Ealing Transition has been an absolutely crucial, crucial one. Had the links into Ealing Council. We've built a great relationship, great tripartite relationship with the council who really just come to us. They try to persuade their schools to participate and they, they come to us to deliver it through the MP who one of our board directors knew that we were introduced to Harrow Council, their energy manager has been hugely supportive and he's been marketing our, you know, our project to schools. And then over the last year, we've been working very closely with Crew to deliver a number of solar sites, which they had identified. And through that met the Archdiocese of Southwark, who have decided after quite a few years of probably resisting it actually to become great proponents of solar on their schools and are now regularly introducing us to other schools, other church schools within the diocese. So we're talking to, I think, seven of their schools at the moment. And then uh, again, various ad academy trusts come across us. We get introductions from Joju Solar, Bowder Roofs and some school building surveyors. Um, and I'd also just mention the, the ELSEF fund here and, and the GLA have been a great partner too. This makes, the, uh, makes what we offer both more credible and also more financially viable. Because as I said, it's hard, the margins on these school solar projects are tight. So it helps that it's a community energy organization doing it. And we're, we're flat out, um, we're over flat out really. So we're very aware that there's a number of other London boroughs who are interested and we just, well, there's three, which we just haven't really been able to follow up. We've got enough to do as it is. So if I can just go on to the LCEF slide, the next one. Thank you. I just I think the uh, London Community Energy Fund, I'm glad Greg and Emma are on the call because I really want to sing their praises. The, the Capital Support Fund, I think, is an outstanding innovation because it's enabled us to deliver projects on every single school that wants to go ahead. Um, the margins are usually, at least until the electricity prices soared in the last um, six months or so, the margins were often really tough 
and this has just enabled those you know, nearly feasible projects to become feasible. And it's also enabled us to do really sensible things, like instead of putting solar panels up on half the roof, when the uh, when we're up there, it's so cheap to fill the roof. Um, but the school would then be exporting a disproportionate amount of electricity if we were just running it on a PPA basis. So the the LCEF grant enables London to have more renewable energy, highly cost effectively. And uh, also say it makes us, just gives us a more attractive offering to the schools. So I've just given you three examples of schools there we completed in the last year with LCEF phase four, 20 odd thousand pounds of grant, led to community investment of £90,000. And at Selborne, um, we were already doing half a 30 kilowatt system there. But with the LCEF grant, we were able to increase it to 60 by filling the school roofs. Very satisfying. Uh, and uh, there'd be quite a lot of export there, but it doesn't matter because the LCEF grant made the whole thing feasible. At the Gr at Grange School, um, the extension is quite expensive because of the nature of the roof, but it's a good 30 kilowatts up there, and the, the, the grant enabled that to happen. And at West Acton, which is a fairly small primary school, that's the uh, picture of Mr Khan and the uh, MP for Ealing at the school when the installation is being done. Um, again, we put up a, a, a system probably 50% larger than we would have done if we had just relied on selling the power to the school. So well, well done, Elsef. <clears throat> and um, if I just move on to the final slide. This isn't London at all. It's actually inspired by the, uh, the, the London Community Energy Fund and North Lincolnshire approached Energy for All. Uh, Zach and I are doing a lot of work on this one. It's a unitary authority, but smaller, uh, based around Scunthorpe, but smaller than many uh, London boroughs. <clears throat> and uh, they said, we want a community energy organisation and we have a grant from the town's fund. We would like to support it. So they're providing 40% of the cost and share offer for the other 60%. Very big project, three megawatts or so, just with the first uh, 30 buildings. But it's, it's, it's LCEF inspired by doing this, let's fill the roofs, um, let's make every, every project feasible. And the, the council have been hugely proactive in identifying the sites. So I think as an example of collaboration, this is probably the blue ribbon at the moment. I'm saying it slightly before the project is actually launched, so it might all fall apart, but uh, the, you know, the, grant, the grant is there, the schools are signing up, we're building this summer, the share offer is going out in a few weeks. And uh, say, I think it's, I was just say again that it, uh, it was inspired by Elsef, so it's great to see it's been taken up and replicated in other parts of the country. That's it. That's my ten minutes. Possibly slightly over. Sorry. No, I think mm -hmm. you're almost exactly uh, to the second mic. That's right. quite terrifying, and I bet you didn't even rehearse this, did you? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Mike, thank you very much. I know you have to leave soon, but you are you have enough time for the Q and A session. There's a couple of questions that have already uh, come through from the chat. I'll bring them in the Q&A. If you feel like you want to type in uh, any links or anything further, and specifically in response to them, that's fine. Uh, but otherwise, I will bring you in uh, at the Q&A very shortly after our next speaker, which is Nick Hartley from Brent Pure Power. Nick, over to you and uh, some exciting news about your recent project. Over to you, Nick. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Perfectly. Uh, excellent. Good. Um, so we're just a small uh, organization by comparison of what you've heard already. Um, we got started in 2015. Um, we are a community benefit society. Currently, we have six directors and we're now up to 82 investors. Uh, we have four projects completed um, and uh, I'll just run you through the first three before concentrating on the fourth, which is the largest is the one you want to speak about. Um, I, I'm not sure I can really um, you know, honestly generalize about large installations. This is a, a one off. Um, we won't necessarily repeat it, but it was a wonderful opportunity. Um, I'm talking about the Capital City Academy. So anyway, talk about the first uh, slide. Um, that's the basic information on how we got started. 
um, we many of our members are also friends of the earth and transition members. Um, we were fortunate in getting mentoring from Brighton Energy Co-op, which was arranged by Co-ops UK. Um, and we had a grant from Esme Fairbairn to pay, basically to pay Damien Toe's uh, expenses coming up here to London and uh, telling us how to do it. Um, we also had a grant from UCEF. I think uh, we used six six thousand of a ten thousand, um, and most of that went on the uh, the legal processes to get our first project up, up and running. Uh, we did also pay for a survey of Brent, uh, which revealed a lot of sites. Um, most of which we approached. Um, I'm afraid in those days, in 2015, there wasn't much enthusiasm. We got it down to three schools and then finally down to one. Anyway, next slide, please. Uh, right, so our first, uh, this was our first um, installation at Queen's Park Community School. Uh, two, almost 200 panels on the science building roof. Um, it's uh, nominally 50 kilowatts and generates 48,000 megawatt hours per year. Um, the uh, estimate was for 42,000, so it's conservatively rated. Um, the school is still paying five pence a kilowatt hour. We haven't felt necessary to increase that, um, although we are allowed to, in terms of our lease, uh, increase by RPI. Um, we are paying the investors 5% interest and they can have their capital back when they want it, uh, but they don't have to take it. Um, that initial feed in tariff has increased now to, I don't know, 40 or 15 pence. And the installer was a German company who operate in this country called Serventix. Uh, out of three um, quotations, they gave us the best uh, value um, for money. Um, anyway, that's been running uh, fine now, no problems. Next slide, please. And then there was a long gap uh, till 2020. Um, we just got this, these two installations are on a nearby primary school. Um, or there are two, in fact, as the Mallory's infant and junior schools, um, 27 kilowatts on the infant school, 24 on the junior school. Of course, they're less than 30 kilowatts, so the um, we don't measure the export they just get a 50 percent deemed export um and we got we just got that done in time before the feed-in tariff disappeared completely at, at the end of march 2020 um so we are getting something for, for that um and again the economics worked out quite well we're still able to sell to the school at five pence a unit um Again, the installer was Serventix, um, though I think they, they subcontract the installation to a, a small group of lads from Northern Ireland who do a very good job for us. Um, uh, anyway, that was the beginnings of COVID, and I think I, I shook the hand of the uh, lead installer <laughs> without realising I shouldn't have done that. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so that brings us to uh, 22. Um, this is Capital City Academy. Uh, it has an enormous, beautiful building designed by Norman Foster and Partners, um, and we actually have links with them through one of their architects. Uh, his name is Armstrong Yakubu, and on the left you see the uh, panel layout for the um, projected design, um, and on the right what has actually been made. Uh, I think uh, Armstrong took exception to the presence of the panels on the small triangular bit at the front. Um, don't ask me why, and I don't know how many uh, passing birds will be pleased by the uh, the, the view. Um, anyway, um, this was uh, quite a large project, as you can see, um, 650 odd panels, 300 kilowatt uh, rating and projected production of 263,000 kilowatt hours per year. Um, now, we could have covered the whole roof. It's it's pretty, pretty large, and I think it would have taken up to 500 kilowatts. Um, but uh, at the time, uh, we were worried about the possibility of generating too much, and we weren't sure what the export tariff was we might receive. Uh, turns out that <laughs> under the circumstances, it looks like it, it could be as high as 7.5 or maybe more. Um, just don't know. With electric electricity prices, um, you know, escalating madly, uh, it could be higher. Um, so uh, it was a large investment. Uh, however, we did manage to raise it inside of four months. I'll come to that later. 
Um, I should mention that in case of Mallory's and Capital City, what we what we're doing the financial model is to repay the investors five percent per annum, um, and on top of that, four percent uh, interest on top of outstanding capital. Um, now, here's here's a problem. Um, we still don't know what the um, self consumption is going to be. Uh, I put three figures down. Uh, <laughs> The uh, installer Genfit uh, used solar edge technology and they came up with a figure of 70%. When I queried this, they said, well, uh, that's what our solar edge designer software predicts. On the other hand, Solventix, who also gave us a quotation, came up with a figure of 90%. Um, uh, in the meantime, I got hold of a time series of, uh, of readings, um, uh, half hourly readings from the school themselves. Uh, and uh, made an enormous spreadsheet which came out with a figure of 84 percent so uh, we'll be monitoring that carefully as time goes by to see which of those figures it is we, we can cope with all of them but um, uh, the higher the better obviously uh, next slide please um, uh, the, and this is the results of my modeling um, these four curves are four quarters of a year uh, a week at each, um, just as a sample to show you how the um, the school consumption is the red trace, the solar production is the um, is the blue trace. Um, so you can see that uh, winter time not much is being uh, developed. There's no problem there. Springtime likewise. So the crucial the crunch point comes in summer when you're getting uh, generation exceeding consumption. Um, uh, however, all this, all of this may just be academic because if we get a, um, if we get a feed in an export tariff of seven and a half p, and we're getting eight pence from the school, then there's really doesn't really matter where the electricity goes. We're still getting uh, amply rewarded for it. Next slide, please. Um, right. So this is the first time we've used um, the uh, Genfit. Uh, by the way, they they do a lot of work for a Brighton Energy Co-op, and that's why we chose them. They gave us a very good quotation, um, uh, and uh, so the solar edge technology is a very interesting one. Uh, you probably know about this, but um, you, you, for every pair of panels, you have a thing called an optimizer, which uh, does the maximum power tracking. Um, and puts out a constant DC voltage, which is fed to um, common um, inverter. So it's like separation of, uh, of um, functions here, electronically speaking. And um, the, it, it does mean if one panel goes out or there's shading or something like that, um, then it doesn't affect the, the uh, performance of the entire array. Uh, okay, next slide, please. And you've got a minute left, Nick. Oh, okay. Sorry, I take a bit too much time. All right, this is just a, a, a sequence of events um, in the uh, in the project. Um, we did manage to raise capital in four four months. That was great. This is how we how we did it. This was our method of publicity. Um, uh, uh, next slide, please. Um, and this was the legal side. As so, I mean. Basically, the delay, the long delay of a year since we launched in June 21 and we completed this this just just uh, last Friday um, was mainly down to legals. And this is just a headache, I think. And we learned a few lessons, which I mentioned at the bottom there. Um, maybe it's embarrassing sitting in people's capital for a long time waiting for legals to uh, to complete. Uh, right. I think I'll, I'll leave it there then. Nick, uh, that's really, really super helpful. Thank you for doing that. Congratulations on your project. Very exciting to hear that you could possibly return to Capital City. And uh, anything that puts some solar panels on a normal Foster building is uh, is welcome in my eyes anyway. So well done. Yeah. About we'll we'll uh, certainly consider it. And, and by the way, we have won an Eco Award from Brent, Pride of Brent Awards, which we're attending next week. OK, well, I can see that the, the chat column is uh, uh, alive. Uh, with lots of questions. Mike, you're doing a really game job at responding to some of the questions. Nick, you may or may not want to review some of those and respond to those, but Mike, just to make you work even harder, we may ask you just to kind of like cover some of those questions in the Q&A, which we'll come to immediately after our next speaker, Tanuja Pandit of Power Up North London and also Sales Treasurer. Tanuja, over to you. Thank you, Nick, as well.
Thank you, Said and Catherine. Grateful if you can put up the first slide. Coming. Great, we could just move on from there. Thank you. So we, we can't claim to have installed on a Norman Foster building, I'm afraid, but uh, Power Up North London, we are uh, members of Community Energy London and Community Energy England. Um, we were established in 2015, like a number of other London-based community energy groups. And our primary focus um, has been since the start to uh, install rooftop solar. We've got nine sites installed so far, of which uh, Punnell owns four of the four of the the sites, and the rest are um, sites where we helped with the end-to-end -end project management and installation of of the solar panels. Um, we also have a heat pump project underway in a, a local community centre in uh, in Islington uh, with uh, support from Crew Energy. Um, and we work with a number of uh, community sites with what we call route to, to carbon to zero carbon studies, which are basically decarbonization uh, studies for those sites. And we do some energy efficiency work. Um, it's pretty ad hoc. It's, it's not a kind of regular service of the nature that some of the other community energy groups are doing, uh, but we might well um, move on to that uh, in time. And we have some big targets for, for growth, uh, for Punnell. Um, we principally um, put figures around the solar PV growth, which is, we hope to grow to 1.3 megawatts by 2026. And we're working on a significant pipeline of, of sites and to, uh, to achieve carbon savings of 300 tons a year at that point. Um, moving on, Catherine, to the next slide. Um, I'd just like to tell you a little bit more about uh, some of the sites where we've installed. So um, the top left, uh, St. Anne's Church was the first site we installed on. That's a, a grade two listed church in Highgate. And as you can imagine, it was quite a challenge getting planning permission for that. Uh, but the, the team uh, succeeded with support from the local community. Um, other sites we've installed on Hampstead School, you can see that to the right of Hampstead School, uh, we've got the uh, a, a community owned golf club. Um, bottom left, uh, that's Kentish Town uh, Primary School. Uh, and then in the middle down there at the bottom is a local GP practice in Camden. And to the right of that is possibly our largest installation on, uh, I think there were 102 panels, um, a, a school in Tower Hamlets, Morpeth School. So it's it's a range of sites that we work with. Uh, this just gives you a flavor for it. And the, the model that we use is, is very similar to that of other community energy groups. Um, uh, we couldn't have done without the, the grant funding that we've received through ELSEF and, and other um, grant providers for the feasibility work. And then uh, for the Punnel loan sites, we've um, issued share offers uh, to the local community. We've, I think we've done four share offers so far. We've raised 141,000 in, in share capital from 150 investors. But in total, we've raised 370,000 pounds through grants. And so a lot of these grants are uh, ones that we've supported other community groups with. So they might not necessarily be projects that Funnel has necessarily been uh, intimately involved with, but we certainly supported them with their grant applications. And thus far, the, the solar that we've installed, we, we compute that as saving 70 tons of carbon a year, which is equivalent to the electricity to power, let's say 74 homes in the UK. Um, next slide, please, Catherine. These are our uh, route to zero carbon projects. Um, the top left is um, a primary school in Islington. The one in the middle at the top there is a secondary school um, and also the bottom left. Those, those three were funded through the Salix Low Carbon Skills Fund. Um, so that was a, an interesting departure for Punnell in January last year. And since then we've done other decarbonization studies. The one at the bottom, there is the sports hall in Caxton House Community Center, which is where we are also uh, busy at the moment um, looking to install uh, an ESO's heat pump once we've um, completed some other pieces of work. I think I'm speaking a little bit more about Caxton House uh, shortly, so I won't say any more there. And to the right, that's a women's charity, Tyndall Manor, who we helped uh, recently with doing a pre-feasibility uh, review of, of their building. And so they also now have a very useful 
um, route to zero carbon report that they can work with and take to the next level. Um, next slide, please, Catherine. So this is the Caxton House decarbonization project, the top left, just the, uh, the heat loss calculations that, that are done routinely as part of the decarbonization study. Um, the, the other two slides at the top are just to show the, the fabric improvement work that we've been doing with them. We supported Caxton House to um, get a substantial capital grant from LSEF to replace all of their windows with triple glazed high performance windows. And I think they've got 43 of those. So they also had to raise some capital funds from another source. And um, the building now is, is transformed really with, with that. And it's, a, it's a joy to be in. It's got, they've had lots of positive feedback from their user groups. And also they are starting to get more people hiring the place because as you can see from the windows there, I mean, literally, there, there was they were they couldn't be open. They were opaque. Um, you couldn't ventilate the rooms properly. So all that has changed. Um, we've also we're also looking at other actions uh, that they can take. But uh, for the moment, the big changes are uh, window replacement, uh, refurbishment of external doors, and our next step is to introduce a building management system that will help them to control their heating uh, at a much more granular level and thereafter to introduce mechanical ventilation with heat recovery. And then the final stage will be the installation of an air source heat pump, uh, which we are looking to fundraise for at the moment. Um, next slide, please, Catherine. Um, this is the energy advice work that we've done. Uh, the, the bottom two slides are really work that we did a few years ago at Caxton House Community Center. But the top two are more recent, uh, funded through the through CELS um, subgrant last year. Um, this is a fund funding that CEL received through LSF4. And uh, we did some very interesting work with that, helped very much by Alex Hartley, who ran an energy champion program for us. So uh, we trained, I think, up to 10 people through a multiple week program last summer, um, which was great fun, but also uh, you know, gave us gave some of us the skills and confidence to go out there and run sessions ourselves. Uh, top left is a one-to-one -one session that we ran as part of that same program, and and on the right is is just an example of a leaflet that we use to uh, bring local people into the into the energy advice session. So the the idea was that we'd run a group session and then follow it on with one-to-one -one sessions of the kind that you can see there. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so that's just uh, a summary uh, of, of the, the kind of impact that we can have. We've been listening to uh, other speakers talk about the impact that they have. And I, I, uh, I'm fully committed along with you know, other panel volunteers and, and our directors to this, this area of work. We can see the difference that our work makes local people. Uh, we can see how it helps them uh, in terms of uh, resilience and, and of course uh, their engagement with the share offers that we put out there, their engagement with us as volunteers show how they, they not only take financial ownership, but also uh, a very practical ownership of the space of, of their right to make a difference uh, when it comes to uh, climate change. And, we also feel very strongly that it is our collaborations with not just with other community organizations who have I have particularly checked there, but also with local councils, uh, with um, other community energy groups um, and local organizations. It, these are very important relationships for us and they're, they're really helping us to move the dial. Um, so thank you for listening and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Tanuja. That's wonderful. And just highlights the breadth of work that's going on at the moment the kind of evolution of what power up north london has managed to undertake over the over the past few years uh okay we've taken the slides down nick if you want to turn your camera on as well uh and colleagues if you've got your camera on uh maybe just turn it off so unless you want to raise your hand and catherine will alert me to that uh through the participants because in the meanwhile I will try to go through, we've got around about just over 10 minutes or so. So we've got a bunch of questions. Mike, I hope you don't mind just repeating the answer just in case people weren't um, using chat for one reason or another. So I'll go through some of these. So Mike, a little bit about your financial model at Schools Energy Co-op. 
It's a very standard PPA model. We uh, <clears throat> charge the schools for the power they use, not for not for anything exported. So we have export meters at every site, um, and uh, the price is a function of what the system costs, what the internal use is, whether there's an LSEF grant, how much the generation is. We aim to make um, a return of six and a half percent on the basis that we are returning the capital in uh, over 25 years to members. Um, it, in practice, we get to make a bit less than that because that assumes everything works smoothly and the risks are more on the downside. Uh, <clears throat> we cover all the maintenance costs and any other expenses within that. We give the solar array to the school fully maintained after 25 years. Um, and we pay interest to members of, or most of our members of four and a half percent, the original shareholders receive a little bit more. Um, I think that's Okay. That's really and it. There's not. There's yeah. nothing. There's nothing unusual about it. Okay. And uh, uh, Alex uh, Hartley and Nadi have both asked, and I think you've responded as well in the chat. And Nadi you sent your email about working with existing groups in parts of London that have our schools energy co-op to help them out. Well, uh, it's with with the uh, Archdiocese of Southwark that covers a very wide area indeed and we, we we started working with them through crew and the first four schools were in sort of the crew area and we're working with crew on those in fact when at quarter past six i'm joining a call to uh, one of those a governor's meeting at one of those schools um and then the diocese <laughs> somewhat to our surprise because they didn't but that's what happened was a school in bexley contacted us and said we understand from the diocese that you're the recommended solar panel provider to all the schools in the archdiocese. We didn't know that, but it was a wonderful thing to, to hear. And we've since been contacted by three schools in um, in Bexley, where I, I contacted uh, Alex about that. And um, also some schools now in uh, Dover. So it's it's beginning to to move along but the archdiocese regard us as if you like a delivery partner now um for their schools which is brilliant news they've mm. if they've got a, i can't remember how many they've got but it's around 100 schools i think okay just to mention in the chat column there's a question by uh, a, a remark by john taylor um of uh, the southeast energy hub who joined us for a short time i think john's <coughs> excuse me had to leave but just on the scale of the projects they work on, it kind of highlights that when you get government support as uh, the Rural Community Energy Fund was a government instrument, the amount of money you get tends to be, you know, five to 10 times the much that we get through LSEF. So, uh, you know, it's a shame that rsef has gone, but that wasn't open to London groups, but um, it was a, a bigger shame as well that the Urban Community Energy Fund, which Nick mentioned, has gone as well. Uh, and clearly we need to continue to lobby government about providing core funds. Um, I think this was a question for you, Nick, uh, which is when your presentation, they've got uh, from Andrew of Active Kinetic. Do the prices reflect the TCO? Forgive me, I don't know that acronym. Does anybody know TCO? Mm, I don't either. <laughs> uh, well, something. Okay. Not to worry about that, maybe Andrew can elaborate that shortly, but uh, what are the maintenance costs for cleaning and so on? Because you've got a large solar array there on capital. Uh, that's a very good question. <laughs> um, well, we we estimate uh, that we should clean every at least every two years. Um, we, ha we did have a contract with Spirit Solar. We haven't set one up yet for Capital City Academy. Obviously, that's a huge scale, um, so it'd be a great difference. But um, I think we were paying about um, about 500 a year for, for uh, uh, electrical checks and uh, cleaning. That's on a on a sort of three year contract. Mike, Anuja, any thoughts on maintenance of solar arrays? I think James is on the call. He's uh, one of the uh, the maintenance solar maintenance gurus. Um, it's like a, a diagnostics expert. 
I mean, most, most of them don't need maintenance. Um, they don't need cleaning. Um, but if the area is particularly grubby or if the panels are particularly flat, they might get they might get dirty and need cleaning or if the pigeons are particularly uh, um, dirty mm. in the in the area. I had a um, quotation from uh, Damien Toe. He said, well, don't clean your panels until you see a noticeable decrease in output. Yeah, uh, it can take a long time. I, I just got around cleaning the panels on my house, which are on a 30 degree uh, pitched roof. Um, they they had a, a number of small patches of lichen growing um, and uh, I had to adapt a roof ladder to get it in the right place. But, uh, we we are finding we are finding some issues now, um, Saeed and, and everybody um, around sort of the occasional smash panel or wires being chewed and things like that. So mm. whereas I was in the camp not until quite recently that they don't need maintenance and you can kind of get away with not doing very much for several years uh, at a time. I am now minded to think that we do need regular maintenance contracts and, they, and also depending on the site, you know, they might need to be cleaned more often um, on some sites than on others. So it is, it is an important area and, okay. and we're learning as we go along. Uh, I know uh, Tanu just had a fairly good relationship with her local borough at Islington and Camden also, which is in power up North London, has been quite uh, supportive of community energy, one of the first community energy funds. How's Brent been, Nick? Um, uh, difficult because we only deal with them for legals. Um, you, you, what, what are you asking in terms of s supporting us? Yes, uh, get um, you know, ha have they looked at uh, community energy in their climate action plan? Are they actively talking to you about developing further projects after the successful scheme? Uh, no, not not really. Uh, but we, we haven't pushed it, but they, they have a, a large scale uh, domestic program, um, which I hear isn't going too, too well. Um, People I know who are having them put panels on their roofs are finding that they, the installers are, are a bit uh, difficult to contact and dates get changed inconveniently and such like. So afraid not not good really. Okay, uh, Nick, you mentioned about your uh, you know investigating export prices and uh, I think that there's been some in the chat there. Uh, Paul Hallis has mentioned about unity and of course electricity prices are going sky high and it says here from Paul that they're offering 14 to 16p for exports. Are you seeing an increase? Uh, in we haven't got that far, I'm afraid, so I, I can't comment. Um, the last I saw was 7.5p. Okay. Um, <laughs> but yes, we are using Unity and uh, going to Octopus, I, I hope. Yes, we use Energy for All uses Unity to a large extent. There's yes. a link with Mid-Counties Co-op, but it's, it's an Octopus tariff, effectively. Right. Okay. Tanuja, any thoughts on export? Have you been locked into a long-term contract or are you searching around for prices at the moment? Well, to, luckily, uh, most of our sites had the feed-in tariff and so, so the export tariff was set through that. Um, I think there's just one site where uh, th there's a smart export guarantee arrangement that they need to put in place, but it's not pun alone, so they're, they're doing their own thing. So I'm afraid I can't tell you what it is, but I know that Octopus are offering 7.5p through their SEG. Um, whereas my domestic supplier is offering me four four point one, so that's all I can tell you on that. Okay. Uh, so on so, had it. Sorry, let me just get my words out uh, correct. There's a a question uh, about the issue of school holidays, Mike. You know, in terms of uh, consumption on site, the viability of the scheme, and you know, how how, do, how have you got around that? Well, we don't get around it. We mm. take account of it when we Ooh. model the school's internal use. Um, and it, of course, it doesn't drop to zero. Uh, the, the buildings are still occupied, um, and secondary schools and at most primaries as well. In, infants can shut down totally, but we don't generally find infant schools are feasible to do at all. Um, too small. It, it, too, yes, too, too, they're, they're small and they don't use much power. Um, but yes, it is. It's just one of the factors you take account of when setting the price for the for the power. Uh, can I, I'll just add two other um, things, if may, I may. One on, on maintenance, we have a budget of uh, one, well, 0% in the first three years to, on the basis it's covered by warranties, and then 1% a year of the capital costs thereafter, inflation linked. And we've never spent that much, but this is on a portfolio. Um, and of course, you spend an awful lot more than that on some sites and most sites you spend nothing 
Okay. That's, that includes the inverter repl the re replacement as well, but they're proving more long lived than I think anyone first thought. Um, mm -hmm. And I just mentioned that monitoring is absolutely crucial and mm -hmm. paying for a monitoring contract is, is, is I would say is essential. Okay. It's not less expensive, about £85 a year to, we, we pay for monitoring um, both generation and export. Thank you for that. Felix of Repowering has also uh, made a comment about schools and their use of power. Uh, you've got a request to Nuja from Talal Kareem asking, uh, could you share the flyer again about your energy advice sessions? I've done it. Well done. Thank you very much. Um, Felix has mentioned uh, uh, maybe in response to Nadia about the local electricity bill. Sorry, I'm just catching up here. Uh, support the local electricity bill and the continuation of RCEF, USEF, and cities outside London are quite immediate issues. Yes. Uh, and just to say, uh, who are we? We're Community Energy London. Sorry, I forgot who I was for a second. Uh, the Community Energy London is doing a workshop with the local electricity bill team on July the 30th. Um, if you'd like to find out more about that, email Catherine, our coordinator, and we can tell you more about that. That's a second workshop, and we'll be having a presentation on that day but from Nigel Cornwall, who's a real expert in these issues of small-scale generation and export. Uh, so that's going to be a really interesting thing. It's on a Saturday, though, so one thing to bear in mind. Uh, Mike has responded to Mona about the project lifetime. Um, L, lots about cleaning uh, and uh, yeah, Felix has said that getting export meters installed can be a painful process, but then the upside is you find out about your PPA prices are high. Um, okay, there's a good, I, I won't uh, re repeat verbatim, but there's a good comment there from Felix. And yes, uh, wind is rather hard in London. Uh, yeah, very disappointing, but when I wander over to Dagenham, it's always good to see the couple of turbines over at the Ford plant in East London. Uh, they're really, I don't know, there's something about them in London. It's just really encouraging. And as I think you head into Munich, you see an absolutely monster turbine. So not impossible in the city. So a challenge to groups to look to see. Uh, Catherine, you've got your hands up. Wave at me and let me know. What's on your mind? Two things. One, um, as Dave just pointed out, that event with Heidi was cancelled. Um, oh. Uh, we I think we missed an email um, and also we've got two minutes until the next one lovely that's perfect uh, Mike I know you're going to another meeting thank you very much for your time today sure. that's been really really grateful uh, Tanuja Nick thank you very much I'm hoping you can stay till our next session and we'll uh, smoothly segue hopefully into community energy in the community uh, if you'd like to bring up the next slide Catherine our first speaker in that slot, hopefully, if I've got it right for memory, is Toby Costin. Correct. Rue. And, and uh, Toby is here. And uh, Toby, I'll uh, hand over to you. Thank you. We'll just wait. Uh, there we go. Uh, next slide, please. So I put the wrong title on that one. I deleted the wrong one. So uh, community engagement. So we've taken a few approaches really to this. Um, so working with schools has been an, uh, an interesting way of breaking in because what it does, there's projects within the schools. Uh, there's kids that we can influence that go home and talk to their parents. So we kind of like that approach. And then we're, we're from the, those kind of mergers, we've ended up with projects with Merton Council at the moment where we're delivering energy cafes to uh, four schools. So it's a really nice way of getting into a community via each school, really. And, and this particular picture here is actually at one of the schools where Mike's Myers subsequently has installed solar PV. So from these eco action games, we end up getting the solar project. You know, it's great that those kind of measures happen. Um, we're talking a little bit about uh, community days. Um, we're going to have a talk about the climate help, which I think is the main sort of thrust of, of, of my presentation. Um, we're going to talk about trees and, and 
and uh, uh, the green agenda and green walls and things like that, and also a realistic approach to building. So next slide, please, Catherine. So the climate hub, but, um, yeah, it, it, it's interesting how uh, this came about. We were actually at a community event, uh, and I happened to be on a stall next to a lady who had a very strange name for a company, which was Green Glued Together. Uh, so I had to find out what that was about. And when I did, essentially she wanted to set up a climate hub, and we wanted to support something like that. So we got together, we got a few more people that you can see in picture on the left, actually. Uh, this was our first event, and we're really lucky that we've got a a free space um, in Southside Shopping Centre, which is the main shopping centre in Wandsworth Town itself. Um, and it's big, you know. So, uh, yeah. Um, this was our first event, and it, it was a really nice event in that I think we had nine other community groups there, and those groups were from every corner of the borough, so from Tooting to Ballon to Putney to Southfields, right across, really. Uh, it's a really, really lovely event to have. Um, and then the, the slide on the right is actually us doing an energy training session, so training people up to be energy advisors. And the interesting thing was, before this event, we, we, had, we invited some of the councillors along to come and see the space and to talk about the SW Leap project that we're running with Habitats and Heritage. And they stayed. I think out of the five of them, four of them stayed for about an hour while we were doing our training, which was a fantastic thing for them to do. So there's Paul White there in the picture uh, as well. So, so it has been a really interesting thing for us. We run a cafe out of there every Friday. Um, and a colleague of mine, Armel, runs that. And we're probably helping somewhere between six and ten people, I'd say, a week uh, through the through the through the hop, which is great. Uh, we're working with the other people, other groups, of parents for future who are involved in the hub, transition to tooting are involved in the hub. So there's a whole network. We're jumping around a bit. Uh, could, but anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll move on to the next slide anyway. So I think another way of kind of capturing the community is people of trees, right? Um, I was a, a part of uh, Merton Council's climate emergency working team, and I think there were 15 of us originally on, on that project. And when uh, we had to vote for which which parts we wanted to be in, I put my hand up for buildings and energy with one other person. When the trees came up, all 15 people wanted to be involved in the trees. So it you know, it really does capture imagination. So the Green Walls on Schools is a project where we've put in uh, SOPI on a couple of schools so far. Um, and it's been brilliant because the council do huge write-ups. They, um, they publicise our name across the borough because we've done these things. We're engaging with schools. We're engaging with the students. So it's a fantastic community thing. And then there was a project called Mercer Garden Streets where we actually... we we funded parts of the planting. So we provided some of the plants. And I think 56 streets uh, then uh, planted things around all the trees in their streets. And it's a lovely community event. Again, it's good for us in the Northern Council of publicizing events and putting it out on social media and on all their news feeds. So again, it's a good way of raising your profile in the community. Next slide, please. I don't think I have a state, I don't have a state with the importance of community days. Uh, it, it, it's certainly profile raising. You get to see lots of people in the day. We've just done a couple uh, uh, this month. That's our mail there. I think we're at um, Common Side, I'm uh, sorry, sorry, Cannon's House in, in Mitcham uh, uh, there. And we were playing some games with the kids, but we we're also offering energy advice at the same time. But the great thing is, you get to spend a lot of time with people. You know, so there were some local councillors there. So you know, when it gets a bit quiet, you can have a good 20 minutes, half an hour chat with them about what they're up to, what they're doing, how we might work together on things. So I think they're really important areas where you can kind of develop relationships that you don't normally get that opportunity. Um, it's also good to hear that feedback from from people in the community about how they're, how they're managing, you know, particularly with the cost of, cost, cost of living crisis at the moment. And we were sort of hearing how people were managing this, and it kind of gave me an, an idea on something we've been thinking about. The lady was talking around how she was struggling. She just turns off her energy when they hit sort of five pounds or something. They've got a target, and they just turn this stuff off. Uh, and if the kids haven't got their computers 
charged up, they can't do the homework. So we're thinking about whether there could be some kind of battery swap out scheme from some of the big solar arrays, like at schools or in churches, where you could actually swap out batteries. And the idea came from actually talking to the local community about their issues and problems. Uh, next slide, please. I think the other thing for us is this sort of holistic approach to building. So what we want to do is kind of go in and scope a building, go and raise the funds for those projects, and then go back. And the best example we've got of this is the VAS Club, where we started, I think, with LEDs. Then we had some more LEDs in the building management system, and a destratifier. Uh, I think the first one was funded by LSEF, the second one was funded by the Wandsworth Local Fund, and then we put our source heat pumps in, which was community share offer. Um, the DeVas Club, then we had training with the staff, so we taught them how to use the equipment, things like building management systems and how the heat pump should work, but also about how they could change behaviours. Uh, and then we also reached out to some of the tenants, so they have, in this particular building, they have uh, social enterprise offices in the top floor, so we did some work with them as well. So it's, you know, it, it's about the building, it's about the people who work in the building, and then it's also about the outreach of people who use the building. So we play the eco-action game so far. Devas have approached us only in the last couple of weeks saying, could we have an air source, air source heat pump open day so people can come up onto the roof and see the heat pumps and you can talk to them, which would be brilliant. And then we've got some cafes planned with them later this autumn. So I think that's another way. Once you get into a building, use that for the immediate area. And say, right, come into the building, come and listen to, to more of what we, we're doing and, and just influence people that way, really. So that's that's our approach. Toby, thank you very much. Is that your last slide there? Yep. Cheers, Toby, thank you very much. If you can get yourself on mute. And uh, thank you for your time today. We'll be bringing you back in the Q&A session. There's already a couple of um, questions in the chat column if you want to have a look at them shortly. Our next speaker is is it neil grant or neil have i missed yep. part of your name i can see no no, no that's that's me perfect um, neil uh w forgive me w i was trying to get hold of you before today because we've not spoken before uh your uh praises have been extolled by your colleagues at repowering london who've been working with at north kensington community energy a really pivotal project in london considering how much has gone in that particular part of london really interesting to see how you've managed to help shape that project with the local community uh, after all the challenges that have been experienced in that particular borough. Yeah. Over to you, Neil, thank you. Great, thanks very much, Sid. Um, yeah, so for those who don't know me, my name's Neil. I'm one of the directors at North Kensington Community Energy, so I'm one of the volunteers in the project, which is part of the Repowering London family. Um, and I'm just gonna share my screen. Um, and so, yeah, I'm going to be talking to you very briefly about North Ken Community Energy um, and what we have been up to in the last couple of years in terms of being engaged in the community. Um, but I thought I'd start with, hopefully, a little fun video. Um, do shout if you can't hear the sound. I'm pretty sure I'm sharing my sound. Yes, I am. Fingers crossed. Go ahead, Neil. Fingers crossed. Here we go. It it's works. Us. It's because I think it's really great to be able to tackle climate change locally. It's vital work, it's really interesting work, and it's wonderful people. We as NKCE are really trying to help and get involved with everybody in the community. We're having an impact, um, trying to change the energy system and transform it to a, a centralized business dominated system to something much more local that is owned and driven by the people. I see the future. I think the future might be uh, the housing association tenant could get benefit of such a team. Great. Um, well, I just wanted to start with that video um, because uh, you know, for, for North Kent Community Energy, like all community energy groups, you know, our engagement with the community starts with our volunteer team and starts with um, yeah, the people who are involved with us in the local community trying to spread the word and get people engaged. And so I thought rather than just me speaking for five to ten minutes, it would be good to hear from some of the other people in, in North Kent Community Energy. So some of you will have seen some familiar faces there. Um, and there's also a few people that you might not have uh, seen before, some of our wonderful volunteer team. 
Um, so yeah, we're North Kensington Community Energy and we're aiming to bring community owned solar power to Kensington and Chelsea. Uh, so the whole of uh, RBKC is where we're working. Um, I, I will spin over these stuff because again, this will be, uh, most people know this, but um, we've got solar panels on four sites at the moment in the borough. Um, so this is um, two schools, two primary schools. This is top, top left and bottom right. Um, and then a community centre, the Dalgano Community Centre. And those three installs were all done in 2018 in our first phase. Um, and then at the end of 2020, in the beginning of 2021, we installed on the Westway Sports Centre, uh, also in North Kensington. So at the moment, our sites are very concentrated in North Ken, but we are hoping to expand into South Kensington and Chelsea, even if that would require a name change. Um, but nice, kind, clean energy could be an alternative for us. Um, so that's, I guess, a little bit about our solar panels, but I know that what we want to talk about a bit more today is actually what we're doing in the community. Um, and like, uh, it was really interesting to see the previous presentation from Crew um, and some really inspiring stuff. And I think uh, similarly, we hope that what we do is, is more than just the energy related stuff we do. Um, so it's the wider community stuff. Um, and so I'm just gonna talk very briefly about some of those things that North Kensington Community Energy are doing. Um, so the first thing that we try and do is empower and engage with the community. One of the main ways that we've been doing that is through our Greener Living Days. Uh, so we've run two of these days so far, and these are uh, fun, family-oriented days in the local community uh, where people can come together, just enjoy themselves, partly. We think that's a really key part of these events, but also learn a bit about what's happening in the environment, uh, what's happening in the local area on environment and climate issues, and maybe get involved in them. And so what we're trying to do here is not make the day about North Kensington Community Energy, but act as a convener for lots of other local organisations and get them all together in one place, you know, put on some really fun things as well that, are, that ensure that lots of people want to come along. And then hopefully through that spark, lots of interesting conversations with different groups um, and with different residents. And I think those bullet points that we had on the previous presentation on the benefit of community days, I'd really... Uh, agree with that and, and um, yeah, echo that in our experience, the, the connections that we've been able to make with other local organisations and with local politicians um, and just the conversations that you're able to have with, with local residents uh, have been really, really invaluable. Um, and Nasri, who is our community champion, uh, he's the lady uh, in, the, in the left on, on this second picture here, um, has been really vital in spearheading those days. And that's been really good. So we do Green Living Days, um, but obviously we are also engaged in the community in some other ways. So uh, we're quite a new community energy group. And so we're only just beginning to give out some of our community fund, um, but we gave some out uh, last year to another community center nearby and helped them install some solar panels on their, uh, on their um, community center. Um, and we have just had our AGM this year and we're going to be giving some more money to another community centre who are um, you know, struggling with the cost of energy crisis. And I think that's a great example. You know, we're really excited as a community energy group to be uh, giving money to other local organisations, particularly in this time of financial constraint. Um, and as I said, Nasri here on uh, the right of on this picture is our community champion and she works for and North Kensington Community Energy two days a week um, and is a really brilliant uh, connection with and sort of, yeah, lightning rod into the local community. So we do this, we, we try and empower the local community through this range of activities. Um, we're also really passionate about education and training the next green generation. Um, and so this is through the training scheme that is uh, run by repowering on behalf of the different uh, local cooperatives um, and so this is a training scheme that happened first in phase one of NKCE we had 16 young people from the borough who were paid a London living wage for a training scheme that ran for around 40 hours 
um, and gave them accredited qualifications in a range of really important uh, skills to be part of the green economy of the future. So that could be around social media and marketing or business skills or around renewable energy technologies. Um, and we're really excited that we're going to be running that again in autumn this year. So we're going to be running it for 32 young people in North Kensington. Um, and yeah, we're really excited about the, the potential impact that will have on, on them and hopefully actually getting them engaged in North Ken Community Energy. We'd love to have some more young people involved and having their voice heard within the community energy, well, within our community energy group. And so our hope is that through this training scheme, you know, maybe next year we'd have some uh, young directors uh, who would come through or young volunteers who'd come through the training scheme and got become part of NKCE. Um, and the third way that we're particularly being engaged with the community at the moment is through engagement on a political level. Um, and so this picture on the slide shows uh, our local MP, Felicity Buchan. Uh, she came on a site visit uh, in September last year. Um, and we've been working really hard to build a really positive uh, working relationship with her. Um, and through that to try and uh, persuade her and ask her to speak more uh, positively about community energy in Parliament. And I know there's been some discussion and mention already of the local electricity bill. That's one thing that we're it quite we, we hope quite close to getting Felicity Brook into uh, get on board with and she's um, a private parliamentary secretary in Bayes so she's someone with a bit of influence so that would be really um, exciting and we're also trying really hard to connect with Greg Hands who's the MP for Chelsea you know as we expand out of North Kensington into the whole borough um, and so I would just say if there's anyone on this call who is a resident in Chelsea we would love to speak to you to help us engage with Greg Hans, who obviously as a minister in Bayes has even uh, greater power to, to affect change. So that's three ways that North Ken Community Energy have been engaging in the community in the uh, past couple of years and will be in the future. So around the community events that we run, around the youth training that we run and around our engagement with politics, both through the council, but also increasingly via our MP. Um, and some of you will know about this, uh, but the big thing for NKC in the next year is the Future Neighbourhood Scheme, uh, where the Nottingdale Ward, so that's actually the ward I live in, so it's very exciting for me, uh, is going to receive a really large amount of funding to sort of pilot a, a green neighbourhood of the future uh, through some uh, GLA funding. And as part of that, we're going to be rerunning this training scheme, so 32 young people are going to be trained by it. We're going to be running three more greener living days um, and building a consortium of other local organizations, environmental and community organizations to really deliver them. Um, we're going to be helping define North Kensington's vision for a green future in collaboration with residents and politicians. And of course, we hope to be installing more solar panels on sites because that's what we love doing. Um, so I think that's the end of my presentation. So I will stop sharing so we can go on to the next speaker and look forward to some questions. Neil, thank you very much. Uh, and you've saved us a minute of time. That's really, oh, I just realized I'm the next speaker. Oh yeah, so uh, <laughs> yeah, that's uh, a good point. I'd forgotten about I that. I'm gonna need that minute then. <laughs> yes, uh, I'll use it well, Toby, thank you. Okay. Next up is me. Thank you very much. And just to see, there's a really good um, series of comments uh, in the chat column. So colleagues do look at those and we'll return to those very shortly after I've done my hopefully less than 10 minute spiel. So there was a number of things that Neil mentioned about, you know, liaising with stakeholders, MPs, highlighting the project to your local community. So one of the things that <clears throat> really was um, raised with Sal a while ago is, that's great, we're getting more projects. Uh, where are these projects in London? That's a good question. Okay, and Catherine has uh, kindly put up uh, my freshly minted slide. So uh, many of you who come to our regular meetings, and if you don't, Community Energy London holds a meeting uh, 10 months of the year on the last Thursday of every month from 6 to 8 p.m. Details on our website, communityenergy.london. So regular visitors to our meeting will know that Community Energy London commissioned last year a map, a project, a projects map. I thought it was really good, uh, but the person we commissioned it from 
said we'd use Google Maps for it. I mean, they did it on the basis of uh, what I asked them to do. And they said uh, it could actually be an awful lot better in terms of uh, how it could uh, represent the projects and the information it convey to a user. Next slide, please, Catherine. <clears throat> so we are now in uh, the last throes of developing a new community energy map, which will have uh, some greater functionality and also allow us at Cell, Catherine and myself, to uh, add new projects uh, to the existing database list that we have at the moment, which is important because uh, the groups are adding new projects at pace and uh, we have got new funds coming through supporting new projects all the time and uh, we need to be able to monitor those, capture those, so as effectively uh, the, 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 the voice for community energy in London, we can represent all the sectors doing to stakeholders uh, to highlight uh, the potential of projects that could really uh, be captured in the capital with a bit more of a push from boroughs and the mayor. So uh, this uh, is the kind of uh, page that you will see when our new map goes live. I think we're at the end of June, aren't we? Yes. So we expect this to go live in the next two weeks. Uh, next slide, please, Catherine. So as with the previous slide, there will be a drop down menu that it'll just have a bit more functionality and ability to dive into the data sets uh, with, uh, uh, with, you know, in more detail. So first of all, uh, it can partition up London into boroughs. So you can search by a certain borough or uh, you can um, mouse over a borough and zoom in to find out what projects are there. Next slide, please, Catherine. Uh, and not only does it do that for boroughs, but it does that for wards. Uh, so one of the things you may well want to do is investigate projects by their council ward. We've had the local elections in May, uh, and as a consequence, we've had a number of new councillors elected or even present councillors may not be aware of projects going ahead in their ward. So if you'd like to alert a council of a project in their ward, this map will help you identify that ward and zoom in and we'll have functionality for a postcode search on uh, the tool uh, when it's finalized in the next couple of weeks. Slide please. Uh, this gives you an indication on where the projects are uh, across London. Uh, the different um, icons represent different types of projects, energy efficiency, solar, uh, a few, a couple of anaerobic digestion schemes, uh, uh, heat projects, uh, retrofit projects, and so on. And uh, you can search for those projects by technology and also by funding scheme. So Shirley mentioned uh, earlier on this evening that LCEF1 had 10 projects. We allow you to also search by those LCEF rounds and we'll be adding in as well those um, uh, specific council, those borough community energy fund projects as well. Next slide, please, Catherine. Uh, and when you mouse over a project, it will give you the name of the project, some details of the project. There'll also be an image of a project and a link to uh, any uh, existing web page uh, on a community energy group's website, which uh, highlights the, the nature of the project. So you can get into the real read detail of the project very quickly. <coughs> Next slide, please, Catherine. And we also uh, allow you uh, to search by parliamentary constituency. So board, uh, borough, ward and parliamentary constituency. And Tim, our, uh, our map person is probably showing some of his political leanings by uh, selecting this constituency in this particular MP, Mr. Corbyn, uh, and, uh, highlight, and it kind of highlights where projects are in his constituency. So again, uh, you must be remembered that London has 74 MPs from memory, which is more than Scotland. Uh, one of the things that we're doing as an output of this particular conference is providing a short briefing, which we'll email to all uh, constituency offices of London MPs. Um, so uh, we know full well that if we want to shape policy at the national government level, we need more to influence our MPs. Uh, we'll encourage groups to do that as well. We already have some great champions uh, in London, like Helen Hayes of uh, Dulwich and Norwood, who I know colleagues in SE24 Energy have been working with quite closely for the last couple of years. 
Next slide, please, uh, Catherine. Okay, uh, final slide, just a few thoughts from me. Uh, and so we want to develop a real comprehensive list of all projects in London. Uh, we're doing well, but we have to capture more in terms of those that are being supported by individual community energy funds. And just to say, I, I highlighted earlier on, in the last month alone, we've seen Hounslow and Haringey create, a, a, sorry, Hounslow and Hackney create a fund, but there are also uh, Haringey um, and Islington, Camden and Lewisham have their own funds as well. So uh, we, we kind of monitor, we're wanting to monitor what projects that those funds are supporting and reflect them on the map. The next stages for the map over probably uh, in early 2023 is we're undertaking a study now to evaluate at the high level what the potential of community energy in London is. Uh, we've been supported uh, for this project by the GLA through funding for the latest round of the London Community Energy Fund. And uh, so what we're trying to do is look at typical existing projects uh, that many of you have been developing over the last five, six years, and then try to uh, extrapolate what the total potential might be at a high level if community energy could develop all those sites or a good proportion of those sites across London. We're also taking a deeper dive as one of the projects that we're undertaking uh, to look at the potential for air source heat pumps. As part of that electrification of heat and the move away from gas, the government has been supporting uh, heat pumps as their technology of choice in buildings. Uh, and then we've got the recent uh, addition of the boiler upgrade scheme, the bus, that will provide grants of up to £5,000 for air source heat pumps in domestic um, homes. But there is no support scheme for larger heat pumps. So we want to find out what the potential is for air source heat pumps in community buildings, whether or not community energy groups can develop these projects. And we're working with um, crew and Power Up North London to help that evaluation process. And uh, we also want to understand if grants are needed similar to the boil upgrade scheme for community energy groups, the typical size projects that they're developing, what level of support, <coughs> excuse me, would be needed from government as part of any grant scheme. Um, one of the things, sorry, excuse me again, I'm just going to mute this up one second. One of the things we really want to highlight to politicians is we're only scratching the surface for what we believe community energy can do in London. At the moment, we have 30, well, we have 33 boroughs in London. Uh, we've already got uh, some boroughs with over 10 schemes. We believe every scheme, every borough in London could have at least 30, if not more projects by the end of this decade. 33 boroughs, 30 projects per borough, we can have a thousand projects at least. Catherine, if you could end the scheme, the slides. Poor side. So we are now going on to the um, Q&A section, I believe. Let me just check. Yes. So if I get Neil's here, let me find Toby and I will highlight him. Toby, where have you gone? Um, for Q&A. So if you have any questions for them, um, please put them in the chat while hopefully side recovers. Um, yeah, I'm hopefully I'm recovering. Sorry about that. I've had a, a bit of a cough for two weeks and I thought I got rid of it, but clearly it's coming back with a bit of a vengeance today. So uh, we've had a whole series of uh, questions in the chat column. Um, Toby, have you seen any just to uh, save my voice for a second that you want to respond to immediately? Uh, sorry, I don't you have seen any, no. I think most uh, of them have been answered. Um, Neil's had quite a few, but he's you've been answering them in chat, haven't you? And then lots about your solar roller at think, yeah. Um, so, so I think uh, one of the engaging questions... Engaging communities, trying to get um, 
I'll take over. Luckily, I think I'm just about okay, Catherine. So That's just to say, one of the first things is, Toby, how have you managed to use the hub, really? Like to sell the idea of the energy to uh, more people? Well, I think the first one was, was the energy cafes. We just found out today we've got some funding for another day, which will be to run events for businesses and more able to pay markets. So, so we'll, we'll have a day a week where the hub will open specific for that. So we'll be working with... Chamber of Commerce uh, uh, and other groups try and get businesses into the hub, talking to them about technologies they could adopt. Um, and then in terms of the stuff outside of crew, but the, the hub team are doing, we've had Women in Art Strange on recently, so there's been some brilliant um, artwork up, uh, one of which was from the soil underneath our feet in Wandsworth, a lady had made artwork out of the, the grit and the dust and the, which was amazing. Uh, we're gonna we've we've had a watch party already. I think it's going to be a second one on plastics because one's got a plastics uh, weekend coming up. Oh, uh, sorry, month coming up in July. So we're going to show a, a movie about plastics. Um, we're arranging some guest speakers to come in um, over the next couple of months. So it's just gearing up now. Really, we didn't get the space until after easter and then everyone was away because it was the easter holiday so it's really been since may um and, and and i think the other thing we really really want to do is get as many of the community groups to use the space as possible so it's really kind of offering up to them so that they can host their own events with it ready and that's growing groups that's transition town tooting it's mums uh, mums for lungs it's parents for future all of the groups that, that you know we're kind of tied to really to get them to use that space I mean, uh, that's a really important thing I find out time and time again. Quite often, uh, many groups working in particular areas are connected to one another. Your hub is really providing that opportunity. You're Sorry, muted, Toby, Toby, I muted you because we couldn't hear Syed. Sorry, I'm back. Um, yeah, so um, I think that's really important. Yeah, we weren't doing a great job of connecting with all the other groups, and this has given us the opportunity to do that, really. So I think that's that, that's probably the most important thing about having the hub, really. Neil, the same question to you. So, again, just to repeat what I was saying, some of my experience has been you're working in a borough, even at a very local level, sub-borough, and many groups are working on similar issues but they may not know of each other's existence i'm just trying to find out if that's been your experience but also has the cost of living crisis for both of you but neil you go first give you an opportunity to talk about energy more actively than uh, them yeah thanks sorry that's uh, a really good question i would say so nkc is about four years old and so we certainly have gone through a phase of just people finding out about us in the first place. And I think, uh, so I would definitely agree that, that sometimes there's a lack of knowledge between different local environmental organizations, just about who's out there and who's doing what. I would say my experience with NKC in the last couple of years would be more that there's a lot of knowledge, but there's not that much coordination. So I would say every, you know, I know about most of the other environmental groups in the area and they know about NKC, but we're all still, partly because we have limited capacity, we struggle to do more than just do the thing that we're currently doing. And so we keep swimming in our own lanes. And I think one of the things that I'm hoping will happen in part through this future neighborhood scheme, where there's a bit of a sort of, let's bring everyone together to define a bigger vision for what a green neighborhood could look like. I think that's where we might manage to sort of break a bit out of those silos and find some shared capacity to work on the intersection of projects. I think at the moment for us, that sort of, so I think, yeah, I, I feel at the moment we do a lot of information sharing where we say, this is what we're doing and we learn what other people are doing. But we, if I'm honest, are still struggling to find a way to say, okay, well then how can we do those things together in some ways? At the moment, that there's not so much of that. We were thinking about doing some stuff around the local elections around maybe having a sort of local environmental manifesto. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't quite manage that in time, but sort of, I think there's lots of potential for that. And I'm hoping that, I mean, sounds like the, the hub, you know, that uh, Toby at Crew is, has got, like that's a great place to, to begin to have those sort of conversations. I think the more that NKCE as an example can, can find those shared spaces to just have a bit of a longer conversation than just 10 minutes of you give us your five minutes and we'll give you our five minutes. I think yeah. the better. 
Toby, um, uh, one of the things that we're, uh, Sal will be working with Toby on is just to get how he got um, the hub off the ground. But, uh, Toby, the cost of living crisis, uh, what, what opportunities uh, has that proven in terms of terms of the <laughs> Certainly, from a funding perspective, it, it, it's made it easier to, to get the funding to run the cafes that, that, that we're running out of there. So, from that, that point of view, I think the other thing is just a lot more support from, from the councils, and so not just Wandsworth Council, because it's Wandsworth, but certainly Mountain Council as well, apply to this because. It bars on that that big in London. Lots of people live in London and might come shopping in in Wandsworth anyway. So, so they've been really good at promoting the fact that we've got this cafe open because they're, they're feeling it. They're, they're sensing it from their own. Um, you know, someone like Wandsworth's got seventeen thousand properties that that. So they're hearing it on a daily basis through their community teams, really. So I think, yeah, I think it's it certainly made it easy for us. And and I think as far as retaining the hub is concerned hosting events like this is really important because it gives the social aspect to the end of the building that we are doing social good and we're helping the local community that's kind of a nice halo glow for them as well which means that we get to keep the space longer i think thanks for that toby uh, one of the issues that have been picked up is uh, approaching uh, kind of bame communities you're both working in areas with very very diverse communities are you finding uh, you've got roots in, I mean, uh, 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 I've met Nasri, uh, she's been bigged up quite, quite significantly in the column by several people. Uh, does that, do we need Nasri's to help us kind of get into those communities uh, who, who, you know, who, who are populated in, in certain parts of the borough to make sure that they can benefit from the work you're doing? Neil? Yeah, I would say absolutely. Um, and I think it's not only, it's not just about uh, the, the benefits of community energy being shared with, you know, other other parts of the community who maybe are, have been harder to reach in our experience, but it's also the other way around that actually, as a community energy group, we are made poorer by our lack of diversity. Like, one of the things I love about being part of NKCE is that actually, it is more so than most environmental groups I've been part of diverse and, and a bit more representative of the borough. Um, and that actually brings a huge, great richness, I think, of additional perspectives and additional skills and additional networks that actually makes community energy more powerful. So I would, um, we absolutely, as NKC, have a, a long road still to travel on this. And it's one of the things that we'd really like to be uh, improving and we, we should be prioritizing more. Uh, but I would just reflect that it's not just about NKC or community energy having something to offer those uh, communities and constituents, but it's actually that they, I think, have huge amounts to offer community energy. Uh, Toby? Um, yeah, I, I'd agree with you and just echo what you said, really. We do need to find people to work with into those communities. We're, we're looking at the moment to do some work with Tutu Islamic Centre um, and a, a, another local um, uh, um, Asian group that is focused on helping people. And they've got a whole range of things that they do. And I think that's probably our best route into those areas. We've been working really closely with um, Cafe Low Settlement, which is a, a youth centre, a civic centre up in uh, Battersea that's very focused on refugees. So they've got a huge Somalian, Eritrean, Middle Eastern community, Iraqis, Iranian, Syrians. And we've run some energy advice sessions like that on the SW Leap. And that's meant that we've, I think, done something like 30 home visits into those communities, which we wouldn't normally get, you know, we wouldn't find, you know, at, at the mission event that I, you saw the picture of earlier, you know, we're not going to find those communities coming to those events, it just doesn't happen. So I think it's really important to find those kind of groups to work with in each area so you can actually reach those communities. Cheers, Toby. Uh, I'm going to do that unusual thing of, I just forgotten I was a presenter, so I'm going to ask myself a question, uh, which I think has been reflected by, um, by um, oh gosh, who is it? Um, I've forgotten. Um, uh oh gosh where is it give me just one second my memory's failing too much going on all at one time it was about hustings where's the question gone for goodness sakes uh 
it was oh forgive me well it was basically about engaging with the local mayor and doing the hustings and our colleague from croydon uh who's our colleague from croydon it's bugging me me Catherine, Connie, sorry, Connie. Connie's gone, so I made the comment. Oh, okay, okay. So uh, Catherine made the comment about the recent hustings that um, uh, Croydon Community Energy did with their newly elected mayor post uh, election. And uh, I'm finding as well, in terms of trying to spread the message of community energy to councillors, and we must remember we've got a thousand plus councillors in London. Uh, there's a huge opportunity there just post the new election to make sure we use things like the map uh, and any other kind of um, opportunities that groups have via site visits, um, you know, any kind of written material and so on to make sure you flag up your project. The problem with energy projects is they're often either buried in a boiler room or on the roof, so they're not terribly visible. The same with energy efficiency and insulation improvements or LED projects. So we will need to do a job at shouting out more about this project. And there's, to be frank, never a better time at the moment in terms of the cost of living crisis and the rising energy prices to flag up the benefits that these projects are bringing to uh, local residents and, and community uh, assets. Toby, I think you wanted to jump in there. You jump in there? Yeah, just two, two bits on that. One, uh, we, we tried to get green hustings, but we didn't get the space in time for the elections, the way it works out. So by the time we got the space, everyone was booked for everything. But we'll definitely look to do that in future rounds of, of elections. The second one was we've got a stakeholder event uh, next Wednesday, actually, at the hub for our SW League project. And I think we've got something like from the three boroughs of Richmond, Wandsworth and Merce, something like 10 to 15 of the councillors coming on to that, which I think would be great. Because they learned what we've been doing for the last year, but we'll also be able to pick their brains about how can we reach these communities that we're not reaching at the moment. Right. So, um, yeah. yeah, just I mean, big, big in action what you're talking about, really. I, I like seeing Helen Mayer's comment in the chat column about trying to get a hub going in Haringey and they clearly want to know a bit more about how yours was funded, operated, resourced and attended, which is exactly why we're going to try and pin Toby down uh, uh, to find that and, you know, delve into his brain and uh, capture that in, in terms of a blog that we'll post on the cell web page hopefully in the next few weeks. So, few weeks. Uh, watch our websites. Um, I think, unless I've forgotten anything else, I think we've got a fair amount covered there. Neil, do you want to so any final comments because of course uh, NKC has done an awful lot in a very short period of time just reflect a little bit more about uh, what your uh, you know future goals are you you mentioned it towards the end of your presentation but it'd just be good to, if you could repeat that there two minutes side yeah absolutely uh, well I'll speak for less than that um so our goals for the next year are very around this future neighborhood scheme so this is this funding from the from the mayor and the council to really transform uh, the Nottingdale ward. That's the ward with the Lancaster West estate in where the Grenfell tragedy happened. You know, it's, a, it's a ward where there's a lot of desire to actually engage because it's a community that has you know, suffered so terribly and had such an awful experience. Um, and through that, we'll be partnering with the council and a range of other local organizations to install solar panels on some social housing run a training scheme for 32 young people, run three green living days that we hope will engage with at least four, 300 to 400 like local residents overall footfall. Um, and through that, we hope that will create some of those new networks with other organizations, a bit like what is happening in Crew through the hub and other places that will allow us to maybe have a bit of a more expansive vision post that on our way to 2025. And uh the way these things work you will get greg hands to visit a site understand about community energy and then he'll probably be reshuffled out it's just the way these things work bloody typical uh i'm afraid uh and uh i heard him on radio 4 yesterday after the committee of climate change report which was not flattering on the government's progress to date in a number of areas and uh mr hands was asked whether or not we are building homes today, which will need to be retrofitted for next year in the future. He wasn't aware that we are actually doing that at the moment, which I found quite amazing, but there you go. Uh, yeah, so clearly, uh, if he doesn't know that point, he'll need an awful lot more advice in terms of community energy. Toby, Neil, 
thank you for your time this evening. Uh, I can see an awful lot of really, really complimentary comments in the chat column about how inspiring some of your work is and clearly groups and other individuals have got a clear opportunity to follow in your lead and we're going to try and capture that so we can spread the message more widely. Uh, we're coming to our next session. Uh, my voice is held up, thankfully. Uh, the next session is, uh, what's our next session called, Catherine? New Roots for Community Energy. Well New done, Directions. Catherine. New Directions. And our first I can't speaker... I not like you, Giovanna, for some reason. Okay, our first uh, speaker no, is spotlight. Dr. Giovanna Speciale. Giovanna, I believe we've got your slides here. Over to you and Catherine to drive them. You ready, G? Yep, okay, many thanks. Um, hi, um, if, you could, if you could start the first slide, that'd be lovely. Yep, two secs, remove. So my name is Giovanna Speciale. I'm one of the founders and uh, chief exec of Southeast London Community Energy. Um, I'm going to give a different kind of presentation. I'm not going to tell you the details of what we do, um, but I'd really like to tell you about the rationale for what we do and what we're trying to do and think about social innovation in a different way. So 12 years ago, I burst into tears on a tube train. Huge sobs that completely rocketed my body. It was embarrassing and unstoppable. Um, and you know, sometimes you don't always stop to recognize a turning point in your life, but this was the start of my personal journey to this place here, where I am now, um, uh, you know, running a community energy group in Southeast London. The reason I was quiet, crying and was because I think it had just occurred to me the enormity of the climate crisis, um, yeah, the enormity of the collapse of biodiversity, of food production systems, of water and resource, the sort of the, the water and resource fights that would burst out all over the place, the migrant crisis, the perhaps an end to human life. And I think what I'd realized in that moment that it was my generation who were chiefly responsible and my generation who were doing nothing. Copenhagen, I'd, I'd recently come back from Copenhagen shouting outside a conference that really wasn't listening. So, and I think this was the start of a determination to do something really hands-on about community, about transitioning to uh, a new kind of energy system that brought me to this place um, and brought me to a place where actually I realized that community energy could be a solution, could be part of that solution for a systemic change to the way we live. And my home is Southeast London and the home of most people who work in, or, or volunteer for CELSI is Southeast London. Um, could you go on to the next slide? So let's think about South East London. So, you know, um, it's a place of contrasts. Um, it presents massive, massive challenges in terms of a transition to an energy, uh, an energy transition. There are fairly low levels of renewable energy, fairly poor housing stock, housing stock that's Victorian turn of the century, housing stock that leaks heat. Uh, social housing full of coal bridges um, and but I think we always recognize that the main barrier to a transition here was the inequalities it's a place of contrasts it's a place where million pound houses sit alongside really really quite dilapidated um, brutalist architecture 1960s um, estates um, could you go on to the next slide Um, and I suppose little did I know when I was sobbing on a tube train that I wasn't the only one who was thinking what we need to do now is we just need to get on with the transition. We can't wait for government. We can't make wait for the appropriate policy. But actually, and actually what I saw in Community Energy and what many of my colleagues who were founder members and a few of them here, hi, Alex, um, <laughs> um, soaring community energy was the potential 
to make a systemic trend was to enable that transition and to do something that was quite revolutionary oh, under the no under the noses of a coalition government um with their tacit approval okay now that's changed uh, we're on a very we've got a very different administration these days but so but i think the point i'm trying to make is that actually what we are trying to do at celsi is to transition to an energy system that is fit for the future and yes that involves a transition to distributed renewable energy massive reductions in energy demand and leaving no one behind we need to mend these inequalities in order to transition this is a huge barrier um could you go on to the next slide so i think what i wanted to talk about is really to remind ourselves that what we are doing is social innovation here um, and to introduce anyone who's not familiar with community energy to this idea that what we are doing is we are using community sector strategies to enable that systemic change. What do I mean by community se uh, sector strategies? Well, we're all co-ops. A community se sector approach is to enable community ownership and democratic control. Um, and the use of community share capital, the use of volunteering, enabling people to contribute in a way that fills their soul, you know, that responds to something that they feel that they want to do, uh, to enable people to feel part of something, part of a movement. Community sector strategy is all about tenacity, local knowledge, local networks. And I guess a whole heap for love. Could you go on to the next slide, please? So, Celsi, what? How does this translate into action in the context of Southeast London community energy? In essence, what we do at Celsi is we push at open doors. The door may be only open a crack, but our I, th I think our role in Southeast London is to look for opportunities to enable a transition. It's not about a single business model. It's not about a single way of working. It's about being there ready to as soon as the door opens through whatever means it be we're there to rush through it so we do own and operate community finance solar we own and operate a half megawatt of community finance solar across 11, uh, 11 sites uh finance through community uh, three share offers but we also do uh led retrofit and my colleague nadia who's on the call here today leads on that um, so same business model as community finance solar, except what we're doing is we're retrofitting lights and for any new groups out there in many ways, I think this is a more stable business model. A lot easier to get across the line, we work in partnership with SC 24 I think some of my colleagues from SC 24 are here. Um, we also are funded by one of our local authorities Greenwich to um do audits for businesses so my colleague hamid um uh goes out and enables businesses to he does business audits and un enables local businesses to understand what they can do to reduce their carbon but critically also their costs um and so he looks at a business in a holistic way um we are and i think many of the in, most innovative things we're doing however are with people in their homes so um we have always 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 done ever since our inception ever since we did our first community consultation who, uh, with people who told us it was extremely important to do this we've always done a lot of fuel poverty alleviation work we've always done work to support our most vulnerable families Last year, we worked, we did very in depth work with uh, a thousand odd households. We have a team of six energy advisors who speak a variety of languages, who really try and get uh, work at the grassroots in partnership with all our fantastically diverse community sector organizations in Southeast London. Um, we do a lot of work enabling access to some of the government funds for uh, energy efficiency. We also run a service for those who are able to pay. 
Um, and I think this is where a lot of our more innovative work, we, have, we, you know, we do thermal imaging surveys, we'll do, um, we'll do one-to-one -one advice, we're working towards doing whole house plans, but in addition, we're working with landlords right at the moment. My colleague Nadia is leading on this. She's using a carrot and stick approach to enable landlords, uh, to, to get landlords across that line. We're also working with tenants. Um, and enabling to access government funding for retrofit on the basis of having fuel poor tenants. We're also working on a single street. Uh, we've got funding to work in partnership with BESCO in Brighton and Carbon Co-op in Manchester on a project that we're calling Future Fit Streets, where we're, uh, where we're supporting a single street to retrofit their homes uh, and enabling them to get cost reductions, but also just trying to work on that sort of nudge theory. Uh, we think that the, 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 the most that people are more likely to retrofit their homes if their neighbour has done so, that retrofit, that a response, a community responsibility to climate change spreads like a virus down the street. So if you could go on to the next slide. So we're doing a broad range of things. We're pushing at a variety of open doors. Some of them are more open than others. I think I've probably run out of time. So I'm going to finish quite unusually with a poem. This is a poem I wrote last year. So forgive me for introducing something rather unusual. Um, and it really does focus on, it's hark back to our very first projects, our very first solar projects. Like so many palms raised in prayer, our panels commune with the sky whisper incantations in a language of positive, negative, and semiconductors, a dance of electrons to the beat of the sun. And we did this. This solar array is made of persistence, a stomp through complexity. We learn to speak the language of leases, of community shares, of kilowatt hours, of financial models, of grid connections and risk profiles. And it cost us dear. But it isn't enough. It's a drop in the ocean compared to what's needed to arrest the flow of drops in the ocean from the melt melting ice caps. It's a tiny stitch to mend a deep fissure. Maybe, just maybe, it's all too late. But we are not alone. We are just one of many community groups making many tiny stitches, turning churches, rivers, hills into places where magic can happen, where sun and wind becomes power and hope. And we ain't giving up. Many thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Woo! So I, th I think that's a perfect example of uh, when we're talking about how community energy thing uh, does things differently and how we reach out uh, to different parts of our community. Uh, that was a great way to start. So thank you very much for that, Giovanna. Um, hang on, please, for our Q&A session. And I uh, will turn to our next speaker, who is Felix White from Repowering London. Felix, over to you. Thanks, Ed. And uh, thanks, G. I'd be happy to leave it there. You drop the mic. Um, but it, it, what it made me think about is um, how uh, I think uh, my experience of community energy is that it does help you connect directly with people. and. Um, uh, I suppose in the same way as the energy system works in a certain way, we're used to the market working in a certain way. And when you kind of step outside those frameworks, see different ways of doing things, different ways of working together, different ways of sharing stories and experience, um, give you a different perspective on, on the world and what's possible. And uh, as much as it is often very hard work, because you're kind of most of the time swimming against the stream, um, uh, it continues to kind of surprise and inspire. Um, and uh, yeah, so thank, thank you for bringing those thoughts to the fore. Um, Catherine, if you can bring up my slides as well, please. Um, in a way, I focused on a similar idea, um, which is, although um, uh, we are, uh, I guess we're rebels because we've, we've, all, we've all resisted the temptation to talk about the techie bits of innovation. Or we've both done that um, and focus on this kind of social side of innovation. Um, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of give an example of 
some of the innovation work that we've been doing that I find inspiring because I think it makes the connection or it shows how infrastructure, different sorts of infrastructure um, can be used to make new social connections. And um, for the infrastructure that surrounds us um, and really is a, is a public asset to be something that connects us rather than separates us, hopefully. If you could move on to the next slide, please, Catherine. Um, I'm not really going to talk about repairs model because it's kind of what everyone's been talking about. I suppose I would just echo what Giovanna said in terms of for us, it's really important uh, uh, to look beyond installing additional generating capacity. That's important. And, you know, I support everyone who does that. But in repairing story, it's always been important to kind of do more of that and to try as much as possible to keep the connections, the, the financial, the social, the employment connections, uh, the, the lived experience connections between um, this work um, and our, our communities. And we're always trying to find ways of doing that more and doing that better. Um, whether that's through a techno technology approach or whether that's through a different way of, 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 of working with other partners or a new business model and so on. So that's really what I'm talking about. Um, uh, I can try and illustrate here, if you can move on to the next slide, please, Catherine. Um, and it's just gonna reflect on, uh, if this is what community energy feels like when, you, when people are able to come together around something, work together, make it happen, um, then actually <laughs> often what you look at, kind of my experience of delivering the project, the next slide uh, looks more like this. Um, it's the kind of often if you're working on social housing blocks, neglected infrastructure behind the scenes um, that is providing an essential service, but no one really cares about unless something's broken. Um, and it's the access point for our project, um, but it's also in a way a barrier because it both technically and, and through legislation, the, uh, the places where energy is generated and the places where energy are used are, are kind of separated. And um, I'd connect that to the next slide, which is um, if that's what, um, we see kind of behind the scenes then uh, in the next slide Catherine sorry I've got so many quick slides um, what we we see in the community that we work with is something more like this um, I had some fun on clip art when I was putting this together um, in terms of uh, yeah the kind of the opacity of our system and um, the connection is not being made between what things cost and where they come from and what their impact is. And obviously beyond that with the next slide, um, uh, and although I've used a bit of humor here, it's sort of funny, not funny, um, from an from energy crisis perspective and the total unaffordability or the total impossibility of people, lots of people being able to meet their energy needs and, um, and yeah, uh, have the basic resources that everyone should have um, to live in dignity. So um, the model that we've been working on, if you move on to the next slide, um, Catherine, and we've been talking about today and getting solar on roofs is great work. Um, but what I'm talking about is a sort of how we've been trying to build on that to uh, uh, essentially, and if you move on to the next slide, Catherine, um, move from this model, which is kind of a finance, it's a it's a finance workaround to the infrastructure challenges. So, for us, putting solar on uh, blocks of flats um, was sort of a place where solar couldn't go, at least from a community-led point of view. It kind of you couldn't do it on your own. Uh, the landlord controlled the space, and you know through negotiation, through a financial model, it become possible to put solar in those places. But where you still can't go um, in most instances um, is to make the connection sort of 
electrically or energetically between uh, the electricity being made on the roof and supplying that or matching that with the consumption of people who live in blocks of flats or who live nearby. Um, and as much as we've been talking about export PPAs in the earlier sessions, and uh, it's great to see higher prices. Um, there's still a lot of middlemen between where electricity is being made at a local level and, and where it's being used. So the kind of what if, or imagining the possible next slide is, if we've got that financial setup, could we make the energy links in a more direct way? Um, and uh, this is something we've been working on and talking about for a long time, and it often feels very abstract. So uh, in the next slide, um, I'm really, really happy to share this with you <laughs> because it's just a bill. Uh, it's just like, um, there's not much there, but what you can see in the red circle um, is this split in the tariff arrangements we've got set up for um, one of our projects between uh, the price that is being paid to the generator for uh, electricity that's gone to the wider grid and the price that's being paid to the generator for electricity that's been used locally. So that's the 115 pounds a megawatt hour for the wider grid and 60 pounds a megawatt hour for the local usage. And the local usage is going specifically to households on the local estate that have signed up to the scheme, which is run by, if you go to the next slide, somebody called Energy Local, um, which is a community interest company set up by Mary Gilly and others to help kind of develop this model and probably been working on it for about eight years now. Um, and uh, I, I kind of I wanted to share this as other projects that we, we work on and there's other ways of doing this, but it's to kind of just talk, yeah, reflect more generally on how innovation happens. And it, it kind of starts with thinking about the possibility of doing something different and then the persistence and determination <laughs> to try and bring that to fruition and try and, if you can't imagine it fully, to kind of think about what bits of it you can start imagining and what allies and you know what partners you can work with to, to start to realize that. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please, Catherine. Um, so really it's a, it's a kind of, it's, it's, a, it's a general message, although I'm kind of illustrating it here with our work around local electricity supply and um, collective self-consumption. Um, and yeah, that's enabled other things to happen that kind of bits of the technical jigsaw, but you know, all that has social implications as well. So um, this is kind of part of a previous so collective self-consumption trial we did on our very first um, project on Elmore House in the Loughborough Estate. And um, to my knowledge, the first project of installing um, communal batteries uh, as part of a, a community solar system on, on, the, on the roof of a block of flats. Um, and uh, when uh, incorporated into this, this model of uh, allowing local residents to, to use the locally generated electricity, batteries really come into their own there in terms of um, helping mean that you know, the people in the evenings can still use um, clean local solar power. Next slide, please, Catherine. Um, so if all that sounds really great and exciting, it is, <laughs> but uh, it's not quite over the line yet in the sense that while the energy local model is up and running, um, it's not yet possible uh, to get uh, long-term contracts for the arrangements that it uses. Um, and so it's not yet possible to finance new installations in our view, as far as we know, we're you know, open to other ideas. Uh, using that model, but it is a way of um, upgrading existing installations, increasing the benefit from them. Uh, they're not opening new clubs yet uh, uh, because uh, it requires the support of Octopus Energy, um, but I'm sure that more will come and I'm sure that other suppliers will start supporting this. Uh, I guess this is one way of doing uh, these sort of local supply arrangements or collective self-consumption. Um, and there's this bill uh, that's in development at the moment, the local electricity bill, which is um, trying to, I guess, create a kind of a wider framework to support them, to support them longer term, and put some obligations on suppliers to do so. So um, I think this is this is the kind of relationship between legislation, which is very much like system level 
uh, change um, and uh, the role of really kind of small scale grassroots led uh, stubborn <laughs> creative people um, imagining different ways of doing things on the ground and how one can can lead to the other and um, I think I'll I'll leave it there thank you thank you, very thank much. you to everyone uh, again just for all your efforts and all your hard work and um, uh, I'd say just from Repairing London point of view, um, I feel like uh, probably like lots of other organisations, the pandemic was a pretty tough time and we were, we were pretty internally focused um, on looking after our staff and communities and, and, and colleagues that we've been working with. And um, uh, I'm pleased to say that um, now, notwithstanding, notwithstanding my colleague Afshin um, being on maternity leave at the moment, um, we're in a place where we've got a bit more capacity to um, to share more about the work we do, learn more from others, and um, hearing all the great work that's happening at the moment with with other groups. Um, I'm really keen to have some more more chats and um, and more collaboration. Perfect. That's an excellent note to end on there, Felix. Thank you very much for that. That was a really uh, kind of helpful run through somewhere of where the new opportunities lie in terms of some of the projects that groups are not only have in place at the moment, but could develop in the future. And some really useful insight uh, into the future for community energy. Thank you for that. Uh, we come to our um, last but not least spe speaker of the evening, Dave Powis. Dave, I know you don't have slides. Uh, I'm leaving it up to you to help uh, provide the last presentation before a quick Q&A and then we'll wrap up hopefully no later than quarter to eight. Thank you, Dave. Of course, no problem. No slides, should be fast, um, probably about five minutes, but there's so much content there that um, I've tried to digest things that I'm going to touch upon in my my slot as well but it's it's been amazing to hear all of you, especially the, the innovation stuff from Giovanna and Felix just now. So thanks for inviting me to speak. I'm um, going to talk about retrofit in particular. Um, so my name's Dave Powis. I worked in the energy industry for 20 odd years until about a year ago when I found my new community, which is you folks. Um, and I've been learning and trying to collaborate and figure out how to leverage the best way to um, empower those around me and when I say around me, I mean those that I've, I've formed networks with both in the industry, both in community, both in local government and across the country, um, um, advocacy groups, campaign groups, all, all of that kind of thing, because there's not a lack of people talking about this. Um, the reduction in demand is a serious issue and, and has serious potential that um, there is expertise and innovation, and I think as numerous present presenters have said, it's talking to each other, collaborating, and then doing. It's, I think Neil earlier and Felix just now, it's the learning from each other and then working together to deliver it. There's no lack of potential in um, retrofitting buildings for energy efficiency, whether they're domestic or, or non-domestic. Um, so that was my preamble. I'm, I'm going to talk about my experience over the last year or so um, diving into this subject matter, um, particularly around how to accelerate the retrofit of buildings to improve the energy efficiency. So the call to do more to boost energy efficiency has been growing in recent months, particularly following the UK's energy security strategy which increased targets for renewables and nuclear, but it totally missed the demand side measures. Um, multiple government schemes, I think we've alluded to earlier, have really missed the mark in delivering the, the required support for people to take action, because that's what it's supposed to do, support people financially or otherwise, educate, um, advocate, engage. It feels more imperative than ever that we come together now to support each other from the ground up. Uh, the most common quote that I've heard that you've probably heard as well, 29 million, dot, 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 fill the gaps. Existing homes all need some kind of retrofit if we've got a, a chance of getting to net zero. 
Um, and in London, I mean, net zero by 2030 rather than 2050 is even, even harder. But if it was 2050, that's one house every 35 seconds. All right, not to mention the non-domestic buildings. So that's a big challenge. Um, the Construction Leadership Council stated that half a million jobs would be needed to act uh, across the various sectors to meet that target. And yet the Climate Change Committee's latest progress report I read this morning um, showing that the emissions rose by 4% in 2021. Um, and it's warning that there's policy gaps now make it unlikely we'll hit net zero. And then it goes on to say, there is a shocking gap in policy for better insulated homes, shocking gap. Um, and I'd add to that, as, as I said earlier, there's even more of a gap for non-domestic buildings. So the ones that community groups often support the community scale venues, um, there's only the smaller ones that can access the, the boiler upgrade scheme. There's no more renewable heat incentive. So at the moment, that's a gaping hole as well. Um, so the retrofit of buildings, and when I talk about that, it's improving the energy efficiency, both from the fabric performance and introducing renewable heat solutions technology, presents the biggest challenge and yet also the biggest opportunity of our time. And that's where we come in. Through the collaboration and inclusion, um, will release the potential to meet that challenge. I think community groups play an important part in advocating and demonstrating, and that's what we've done. Uh, so what we've done with solar, we can do it with retrofit. You go out there, you, you provide these things that are tangible and physical and, um, and educational uh, in people's lives and community areas that they can see and, and learn from. And, and hopefully, uh, as Giovanna said, it spreads like, like a virus. And it's like, well, actually, that looks good. That feels good. How did you do it? I want to do it. Um, but it's not easy. <laughs> and that's why I found that in talking to lots of different groups, there isn't a model. There isn't a one set financial model. I mean, there is no financial model there compared to solar and certainly fit based solar. Um, it, it's not a financial case alone. It, it's there's an Im immature supply chain. There's lack of standards, the lack of expertise. It's bespoke on nearly every property. It's messy, got loads of moving parts, unreliable, inconsistent, and really expensive. And did I mention there's no financial support? So it's not surprising that every, every group that I've spoken to or, or looked into it and thought why isn't this going anywhere why is this not taking off because i'm sure there is a bit of demand there it's because it is it is quite complicated but fear not i have written with an exclamation mark in my notes um i've also learned that we shouldn't be looking at a, a pure financial return um there's so many benefits to retrofit that aren't financial um and i think people are becoming to realize this and hopefully because it's being shouted about across many expert papers and, and reviews about this, the social wealth, the, the, the warmth and comfort, the resilience of buildings, the, the um, social cohesion, the, the greening of neighborhoods and the value that you can't place on reduction in NHS um, costs. It goes on. Um, but you can't do it to people. This saying that I've heard as well, it's got to be something people do together. You can't force someone to have new technology. I mean, look at your, your in-home display from your smart meter, which sure many of us probably do look at it, but I know a shed load of people where that's in the drawer. Um, if you give them new technology and don't uh, elucidate on how to use it or why to use it, um, it won't operate in the right way. So a 600,000 heat pump target a year from the government is, is just that. It's, it's, it's intangible. It's not, it's not going to help just setting a, a target without a, a delivery plan. So I'm probably going to go over my five minutes now. The, um, I, my background then in the last year or so was Stokey Energy. So I, I joined them um, and it, it was a great learning experience and we, we made some really good progress 
last year we had um, a load of solar on a school and a, a great photo opportunity for everyone, um, MPs, councillors and the like. Um, but it also spurred on and we managed to engage with the mayor of Hackney, Philip Glanville, um, and that was part of why the Community Energy Fund came about. Um, we've also got great inspiration from our neighbours in Islington uh, with their Community Energy Fund going great guns. Um, so my time with them was really inspiring, but I realised we needed to focus specifically on, on, on retrofit uh, as the next stage. Um, so we split away me and a couple of other volunteers and we formed home energy action lab heal um, to try and figure out um, how we can develop a retrofit offering to meet the demand for advice whole house assessments as Giovanna said earlier it's not you need to have good retrofit assessments um, and making those available for the able to pay market and also working in collaboration with uh, the council and any other bodies that we feel we can um, develop expertise with and whilst we're doing it we're trying to record uh, our journey into a, a toolkit for other community groups to use so that um, they don't have the same um, lengthy learning period I mean some of some of the great leading lights in retrofit like um, Carbon Co-op and People Power Retrofit up in Manchester, Retrofit Works, they've been doing this for a long time and, and developing models, as Felix said, for what, one of those groups working on it for eight years. It's not, we need to do it now. So we need to share this and we need to say this works, set up like this, this is your model, this is how you go out and, and access these people first and then those. And if we can develop that, and working with Community Energy Learned, and I think that will be a great thing for us to try and do as we go. Um, network. Two minutes, two minutes oh, Dave. Two minutes? Yeah. Thanks. Don't ever believe me when I say five minutes, side. I'm just like you. Um, we've worked with Architects Climate Action Network. We participated in an event at um, COP in Glasgow called Replicating Retrofit. Uh, we brought together those organisations and local groups from Scotland to figure out how to leverage um, the best models for use in your area. Uh, I don't mean business models, I just mean what, what kind of services. Um, there's another event in Birmingham in a couple of weeks called Retrofit Reimagined, which I'm going to. Um, I've already mentioned working with the, the council. Syed's mentioned um, the paper we're writing together with Tom Luff and Mona Khalili on um, scaling up community scale building retrofit and we're getting some great case study info from Tanuja at Punnell and um, Toby at Crew on their projects that they've done or, or doing in the process of doing so I'll be talking to you guys and I know Jivan is doing on doing one as we speak retrofit project so all of these events and initiatives and collaborations and roundtables local electricity bill discussions these webinars all help us do more and collaborate together that's the key, isn't it? There's more than enough work to do. Um, and there is a workable model for retrofit. We just need to spread the net wider, draw in the more diverse section of society around us to help us achieve that goal. As the CCC report said, there's a role for everybody to play. Thank you. Cheers, Dave. I, I think uh, setting out the scale of that challenge in retrofit, which Quite rightly, the CCC called out the government yesterday is always uh, absolutely critical uh, to be able to do. Giovanna, Felix, can I bring you back for the last six or seven minutes before we wrap up uh, the conference? Thank you very much, all of you, for your time. I've just been uh, looking through the chat call. I'm not sure if there's anything uh, that you've seen particularly want to hi highlight, but one of the things I think that's been picked up is about training as well. So I think one of the things community energy groups have been really trying to do, and it's been something I've been quite keen as well, is how do we bring new people into the sector, and especially younger people or even older people who want to retrain? Giovanna, have, have you had any experience of doing that? Because you know we're trying to bring in a, div a diverse community, but that also means older people, people with wider range of skills who can bring their knowledge and experience the sector from perhaps other trades and, and industries. 
Yeah, I mean, I think we often, I mean, the, the, the thing is that repowering set a fantastic mould in terms of an internship programme. However, we find, we have found that that kind of internship programme is quite expensive and difficult to fund. At Celsi, the route we've gone down is really to work in partnership with apprenticeship schemes and training schemes that exist in our <coughs> local area. So there's one, uh, there's an organisation called GLAB, Greenwich Lo Local Labour and Business, who provides, um, who will provide for the salary of a part-time member of staff for six months whilst you train them. Two of our members of staff have come through that route mm -hmm. um, and others have, have gone on to different kinds of opportunities through that route. Um, we're also working with an organisation called Catch-22 at the moment, um, who provide, who will pay for the cost of training if you provide the either job or the volunteering opportunity. Um, so I think we found that it works, that actually we get a lot of joy and a lot of, um, it's extremely rewarding working with people who, um, you know, find themselves in a very difficult place in life, bringing them from that place into, uh, into employment, into a really uh, interesting um, job in which they, they find themselves a role in the community. Um, but yes, we, you know, so I would suggest to other groups, certainly look into the, 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 the local opportunities that are available to you. Mm. Dave, uh, over the period, uh, over the span of your speech, which was a bit more than five minutes, I think something like uh, 18 houses should have been retrofitted. Um, where's, <laughs> yeah. where's the army for uh, the retrofit? So as part of your plans on local area energy plans to do retrofit, wh where do you see those, those retrofit people coming from? Um, I think there are retrofit assessors in the community, um, probably on a register already, a Trustmark register. Um, there'll be designers as well. So this is more more the um, assessment stage rather than the delivery. So supply chain will have to come um, slowly, building up um, recognised and trusted installers, partnerships, um, whether it's external wall installation or um, heating engineers, and offering the training and signposting them to training to skill up um, point to past 2035 standards that they'll need to work to in future point to the fact that certain standards will be coming along um, and it is, it is building the demand if you book them they'll come build the demand and make sure that you're working with the right partners so that you're getting the quality of work so i think that's why past 2035 was designed in the first place because of the poor quality workmanship so I don't have the answer to building the supply chain, but if you if you put the demand there, certainly according to the current government, um, a solution should follow. Can I ask you just one thing, uh, Dave? You're based in North London, Giovanni. You're based in South London. I'm just trying to, you know, there are these bits of sub-regional London and the way in which boroughs work with their with their with their communities. Uh, I, I, and one of the things I was on the Waltham Forest climate emergency commission and what the, one of the challenges i found was getting boroughs to talk to one another so if you can't even work with your neighboring borough i'm just wondering how we're going to solve this problem between looking at you know the span of your two respective boroughs which is islington and lewisham i think so you know just thinking about that at the moment have you any thoughts on that giovanna look you just introduced them to one another so <laughs> in many ways it is because of Celsi that Greenwich and Lewisham talk to one another yeah, on energy issues. Right. We brought Bromley into the fold. Yeah. You just introduce them. You make the links. You say, hey, talk to one another. Um, and uh, as a result of those introductions, you know, our, our boroughs have started working together on bids and thinking of themselves as a, you know, a micro region. Certainly in Southeast London, I think it really helps um, with regard to sort of some of the energy advice, energy advocacy, fuel poverty alleviation work. Um, it certainly helps that um, if your local authority sees the advantages of working in a sub-regional way. We have a sub-regional fuel poverty alleviation partnership that works in, that has been incredibly beneficial in that all the organizations 
who work on fuel poverty cooperate. We don't compete with one another for funding no. um, and we take a strategic approach. Um, if any of you want to use that as uh, an exemplar in your local areas, please get in touch. I'm, I'll, I'll, um, with myself or Martin and Brian, we can talk about that approach. Dave, I've probably done you a disservice by saying you're oh, living in Islington. I've got a feeling I should have said Hackney. There's a, you're probably right at the crossover point or something. But uh, what's your experience of the boroughs working together and where community energy can fit into that dialogue in terms of like building bridges? Oh, definitely. I mean, I am on the cross section of Islington, Hackney and Haringey. And I think all three of those work well together, especially Islington and Hackney, because I think the the model for the community energy fund has been shared between Islington and Hackney. Um, don't quote me on that, but I think I think it has. Um, and where you can see boroughs next to you, maybe it's a neighbourly thing. You can see stuff happening. It's easier to connect, as Giovanna said, um, in terms of the actual councils and boroughs. The community groups connect. Like Giovanna and I have spoken about these topics, um, even though it's rather a long way when I suggested going down to see you but uh, yeah I think neighbouring um, boroughs um, and uh, yeah I'm just lucky that I'm in a really proactive one at this point in time and Waltham Forest as well is an exemplar and then you know the London Council's paper on retrofit there's a lot of councils involved with that um, so it's okay shame. well I think um, one of the things that's uh, really important to recognise is just that way in which community groups can really help actually local authorities and officers and recognizing where the potential is. And one of the big things that we've been campaigning on, uh, both what, uh, at the cell level, but also from the work that um, hopefully we'll try and to inject into government thinking through the community energy contact group, uh, which has been recently formed and which I referenced earlier, is the fact that lots of retrofit money is coming coming down from government to councils. Councils can't do it all by themselves. I should say as well, community groups can't do it all by themselves. Nobody can. It's going to take everybody else, all of us together, to hit anything like that 35 seconds per household retrofit, um, you know, uh, which is just uh, gives you an idea of, of the scale of the challenge. Um, I've taken us two minutes over time. I'd just like to thank our final speakers for this evening. Felix, Dave and Giovanna. And I think Giovanna really just reflected that thing that we need to do in terms of the energy and climate debate is utilize different ways of communication to really engage people into the debate. Uh, it's great talking about energy policy. I could do it all day, unfortunately I do. But my, what rocks my world doesn't do it for the vast majority of people out there on something which is really critical to their day-to-day -day existence at the moment in terms of the way that energy bills are going and are likely to stay for the next two to three years. I'd like to thank uh, all of our speakers this evening. I'd like to thank our colleagues from the GLA have stayed with us and also uh, to pass on thanks to the Deputy Mayor for Energy and Environment, Shirley Rodriguez as well, in coming along and also for her support and the Mayor's support for Community Energy. Shirley mentioned at the very outset when we talked to her, only 10 projects were supported. Four years on, we're up to around about 130 now. And that's a real testament to uh, the faith that the mayor and the deputy mayor have had in the community to help deliver projects over the last couple of years. And thank you to Emma Gray from GLA there for her kind words there. Uh, with This is only the start of the journey. Today's conference was very much about trying to look to see where community energy can go in the future, both in terms of the size and number of projects, uh, the individuals and groups and communities that we work with and also uh, innovating in the times of technologies and that that thing that Giovanni uh, kind of highlighted so well the way in which we communicate that we work we do to our neighbours to our communities to our local councillors and so uh, yeah this is the start of the journey uh, Cell will be looking to build upon this we've got a number of exciting projects already in train uh, which will alert you to uh, we'll put that on our, our website, communityenergy.london. Uh, we'll also reflect them in our monthly meetings on the last Thursday of every month. Uh, I'm sure Catherine will say to you all, please feel free to email her every opportunity with any thought or anything else you'd like Cell to do. She's raring to go and try and take those things forward with the rest of the board. Uh, thank you all uh, those members who came to the AGM earlier on and to the directors for their unstinting support in helping community energy. Uh, 
I can see a hand from Alex. Alex, I'm already four minutes over. Is it absolutely uh, critical? Uh, uh, go ahead, very, very quickly. I just wanted to remind people of the four more fuel poverty and energy efficiency lunch Friday lunchtime sessions we've got coming up. See our website and come along and join them if you need to. Yes, and in fact, I should have said, uh, Alex is a uh, sales fuel poverty coordinator who has delivered two excellent workshops and that's on the last Friday of every month. So good plug, Alex. And again, you'll find the details on our website. I think I will stop there because the numbers are dwindling down and I don't know about you, but I've got my dinner somewhere to find in the kitchen. Thank you so much, Thank everyone. Thank you everyone for coming along this evening. We're hoping to draft a note from this meeting. Uh, a web recording will be on the website. The slides will be on the website as well. We'll hopefully see you at another event very soon. Uh, good evening all and thank you Catherine for helping bring everything together and to Sydney and Tunisia and other cell colleagues as well. All the best and good evening. Thank you. Bye then.